Good evening. At this time, I'd like to call to order the Planning Commission meeting of June 3rd, uh, June 13th, 2022. For viewers watching at home, some members of the public may be participating via video conference or teleconference. I ask if you're able to please stand and join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Will the secretary please call the roll? Commissioner Bus? Present. Commissioner Lanson? Present. Commissioner Link? Absent. Commissioner McMahon? Present. Chair Newman? Present. Tonight we have with us Deputy Community Development Director John Dugan. Mr. Dugan, are there any written comments, announcements, or continuances at this time? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. We do have. Um, well, the Planning Commission received a couple of supplemental packets from me today. Uh, supplemental packet one were corrections to the project staff report and resolution and ordinance. Corrections don't change any of the project findings or conclusions. Supplemental packet two was additional correspondence received this afternoon uh, since the printing of the packet. And then we actually received a couple more comments after four today on the project EIR and our consultants and staff are currently evaluating the comments and provide responses to those comments prior to the City Council hearing. And that's all for that. Thank you, Mr. Dugan. So now is the time for public comment. At this time, any person may address the commission regarding a city planning matter that is not on this evening's agenda. Should the commission wish to discuss an issue raised by a member of the public, the issue will be referred to staff for scheduling on a future agenda. Anyone who would like to speak under public comments must fill out a speaker card in chambers or click request to speak on the agenda to receive instructions before the public comments portion of the agenda is called. The speaker's remarks should be addressed to the commission as a whole and not to an individual commissioner or staff member. Unless otherwise provided by the commission, speakers are limited to five minutes. The screen will show you the remaining time you have. Madam Secretary, do we have any public comments? No. Thank you. Next, we have the consent calendar with the minutes of our May 23rd, 2022 meeting. Are there any comments? And do my fellow commissioners have a motion? Commissioner McMahon. I move that we adopt the, approve the minutes as written. Will the clerk please prepare us for a vote? Commissioner Buss? Aye. Commissioner Lanson? Aye. Commissioner McMahon? Aye. Chair Newman? Aye. Motion carries 4 0, Commissioner Link absent. Thank you. And we move now to our public hearings. We have two this evening. Will the clerk Please open our first public hearing. Hearing having been advertised as required by law is hereby open to consider agenda item 7A, Municipal Code Amendment MCA 2022-70430 to adopt a resolution recommending that City Council introduce an ordinance amending Thousand Oaks Municipal Code Title IX by adopting new zoning provisions which will replace cannabis retailer medical with cannabis retailer as permitted product to sell from a permitted retail establishment. Located citywide, the applicant is City of Thousand Oaks. Thank you. And presenting on behalf of staff this evening is Community Development Director of Operations, uh, our Community Development Operations Manager, uh, Ms. Uh, Marjan Bizzotti. Good evening, Ms. Bizzotti. Good evening, Chair Newman and Planning Commissioners. So we are here tonight to ask for your consideration to recommend to City Council approval of an amendment to Title IX, Chapter 4 of the Thousand Oaks Municipal Code, specifically within the definition and the allowed use matrix portions of the Thousand Oaks Municipal Code. 
Your consideration tonight will be, first, for including the sale of adult use cannabis products as part of the business operation under cannabis retailer use in the M1 zone, and second, amending the definition portion of the municipal code to remove the current definition of cannabis retailer medical and replace it with two new definitions entitled cannabis retailer and medicinal cannabis. So a little background information for you. As you may recall, in November 2017, Council allowed one medical dispensary and one testing lab to operate within the M1 zone um, classification. Among many qualified applicants, in July of 2018, City selected the top candidate, Legendary Organics, to operate as City's sole medical dispensary. Leaf Dispensary came in as the run runner-up. In December 2019, Council opted to allow a second dispensary in the city. And in January 2020, LEAF, which was the runner-up in the process, was selected as the second dispensary. On February 4th, 2022, both dispensaries began their operations. Two weeks following their opening, both dispensaries expressed concerns about the medical-only restriction, stating that not allowing the sale of adult-use cannabis products under the current medical restriction would cause their businesses great financial hardship. Both dispensaries demonstrated that the number of people who walk out of their establishment due to the medical-only restric restriction exceeds the number of patrons who stay and shop. Because of this unforeseen circumstance, in March 2022, the dispensaries asked the city for a municipal code amendment to allow the sale of adult-use cannabis products to, to those over the age of 21 in addition to the sale of medicinal cannabis products to those who possess a medical card. On April 12, 2022, Council heard a report from staff, listened to testimony from both operators, and initiated the MCA, directing staff to draft an ordinance to allow the sale of adult-use retail cannabis. Since part of the cannabis use amendment requires certain minor zoning changes, we are here before you to ask for your recommendation of approval of the changes to the zoning ordinance. This process ultimately requires the changes to take place in two stages. In stage one, staff is asking the commission to recommend to city council to amend the definition and the zoning matrix portions of the Title IX. The recommendation to amend the Title IX is the only piece that is within the commission's purview to discuss tonight. Stage two of the amendment is the regulatory element that will be considered by city council on June 28, 2022. This stage, if approved, will amend Titles 5 and 9 of the Municipal Code to allow adult-use cannabis to be sold and delivered within the city. Staff is recommending that Planning Commission approve the resolution recommending that City Council approve MCA 2022-70430 based on the findings contained in the draft resolution and ordinance. And this completes staff's presentation. Staff is here for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioners, are there any questions or comments of staff? Commissioner Lanson. Uh, thank you, Chair Newman. I just kind of have a, a brief question, Ms. Bizzotti. Um, I believe that ultimately when we passed, um, the city passed the initial uh, rules, the, the, the state had a certain thing that allowed uh, cities to actually have brick and mortar uh, in, 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 and not allow other dispensaries to sell across county lines or city lines and that changed correct afterwards yes that has changed and now um, cities can in fact opt to sell retail um, non-medicinal to patrons so at the time that the city had passed that initial um, initiative uh, there was that limitation in terms of they weren't able to cross those those boundary this, lines this yes exactly the city the city did um, this opted for for the medicinal only 
the state, if under the state ruling, you could have um, non-medicinal, but that's what the city opted to do at the time. And it just, it sounds like from, the, from your report that ultimately the dispensary is having problems now because other dispensaries are, are, or other businesses are then driving across county and city lines to sell to people within the city that ultimately is then taking a lot of their potential business away. Correct. Okay. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Are there other questions or comments for staff? I just want to clarify, just to be sure I, I understand um, what, what the law currently does and doesn't allow. Following up on Commissioner Lanson's comment, <clears throat> I think the staff, if I understood the staff report correctly, you were saying that the current situation is that retailers outside the city are currently making deliveries citywide. Correct. But that under current law, our Thousand Oaks based retailers are not. Is that is that an yes, accurate that's statement? Correct. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the the regulatory aspect of that, I understand it's not within our purview. It's 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 a city council matter. But but that that regulatory change would allow citywide delivery by city based retailers. Is that that's correct? correct. Great. Thanks for that clarification. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Okay, well, we uh, have, we go now to public comments. We have, I uh, believe it's two speakers on this case, but one is information or questions only, uh, um, and they're both remote. So their names are uh, Ned Davis, and then this is marked for questions only as David McFarlane. So we go first to Ned Davis. We ask that you state your name and city of residence. Uh, Mr. Davis, good evening. Good evening. Uh, I live in Westlake Village and I am co-owner of Leaf, uh, Legendary Organics. And I'm really only here to answer questions. I didn't really have any comments to make. All right, thank you, sir. Commissioners, are there any questions of Mr. Davis? And the other public speaker on this case, um, I believe, is in the same situation, Mr. McFarlane. Good evening. Uh, you've marked that you're here for questions only, correct? Great. Are there, are there any questions of either speaker? Okay. Well, we will go back to staff for any follow-up comments or rebuttals. Or <laughs> None. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, are there any follow-up questions of staff? Okay, well then, I will uh, close the public hearing and open the floor for a motion or, or discussion. Commissioner Buss. All right, um, I, will, I will open by uh, moving that we approve MCA 2022-70430. Um, I will say that uh, this is probably long overdue considering we've been working on this for almost five, six years now. Uh, I think it's wonderful that we've given the opportunity for our city to increase its tax revenue, to allow uh, two businesses to actually thrive in this community uh, that we have hamstrung um, by restrictive laws. And uh, I'm grateful that uh, we get to play a small part in it. Thank you. Commissioner Lansing. Thank you, Chair Newman. Um, I, I will support the motion as well. I'm, I'm, you know, again, it's beyond our purview, but I'm frustrated between the federal and state government that we have all of these weird things we have to sit there and manipulate and, and move around in terms of the coal memo and is it legal, is it not illegal, do states allow it and stuff like that. And again, it's so frustrating because we obviously are just basically subject to what they're doing. So I would ask that uh, the, the governments get together and figure this out so we don't have to sit there and go through these kinds of things. Uh, but with that said, I, I agree with Commissioner Buss and I will support the motion. Thank you. Commissioner McMahon. I will also support the motion just out of fairness. That's all. It's just fair that you guys get to do that. So. And I'll, I'll, I'll also support the motion. I concur with the other comments that this is a move toward more uniformity. Um, it, it's not fair to Commissioner McMahon's point that our licensed retailers here have jumped through every hoop and are 
obeying the rules, and we like that, but they're currently at a disadvantage, and I'm glad to see that we're correcting this in some small way. So if the clerk would please prepare us for a vote. Commissioner Buss? Aye. Commissioner Lanson? Aye. Commissioner McMahon? Aye. Chair Newman? Aye. Motion carries 4-0, Commissioner Link Gabson. Thank you. This is not an appeal case because it is a recommendation to the city council who has the final say. And we move next to case 7B. Will the clerk please open the public hearing? Hearing having been advertised as required by law is hereby open to consider agenda item 8A, general plan amendment LU 2019-70563, zone change Z 2021-70556, specific plan SP 2021-71106, residential plan development RPD 2021-70558, development permit DP 2022-70098, environmental impact report EIR 2021-71100, Zero, land Division LD 2021-70557, Protected Tree Permit PTP 2021-70559, Development Agreement DAGR 2022-70052, to approve the applications outlined to construct four multifamily residential buildings with a total of 264 residential units, including 34 affordable units, subterranean parking, surface parking, one four-story parking structure, amenities grading, hardscaping, and landscaping, including removal and encroachment into the protected zone of various oak and landmark trees on site. The project contains a land division to create two parcels, parcel one encompassing 8.9 acres and parcel two encompass encompassing 34.1 acres. The project includes a specific plan with the impl implementation of the two planning areas. Planning area one, multifamily residential, is proposed to be located within parcel one and planning area two, existing industrial office building and proposed parking structure is proposed to be located within parcel two. The applicant also requests that the planning commission consider the draft environmental impact report prepared for the project in accordance with the California Environmental Quality Act. Located at one Baxter Way, assessor's parcel numbers 680-0-0, 230-695 and 680-0-230-715. The applicant is one Baxter Way, Dave Eady. Thank you. Presenting on behalf of staff this evening is Senior Planner Carlos Contreras. Good evening. Uh, good evening, Chair, members of the Planning Commission. Uh, the project before you tonight is a request to construct a residential multifamily development and also a four-story parking, parking structure at one Baxter Way. Before we proceed into the project details and evaluation, um, staff would like to go over staff's recommendation on the project that is before the Planning Commission tonight. Um, st staff has recommended that the Planning Commission consider the draft environmental impact report uh, <clears throat> that was prepared for the project and recommend to the City Council that they adopt and certify the final EIR and associated mitigation and monitoring and reporting program um, prepared in accordance with CEQA. Staff has also recommended the Planning Commission support and recommend approval of the various entitlement applications associated with the proposed project. Uh, the first one is the general plan amendment for the 8.8 .8 acre portion of the um, property from industrial to high density residential uh, to accommodate the multifamily residential project. Uh, a zone change from M1 to SP23, a specific plan to establish uh, specific development standards for the project site, and also a residential plan development to construct a 264 unit multifamily residential development. Other applications associated to this project are a development permit um, to construct a four-story parking structure and its associated improvements. Um, it also includes a development agreement uh, which outlines and specifies uh, specific um, public benefits and responsibilities associated with the project. Uh, the project also includes a land division to subdivide the 42.9 acre into two lots, uh, one for the 8.8 .8 acre portion of the property for the multifamily residential and the remaining 34.1 uh, acres for the industrial building and the um, proposed parking structure. Uh, and finally, the other entitlement uh, associated with this project is a request to allow the removal of five 
oak trees and 26 sycamore trees and also encroachment into uh, various oak and sycamore trees and one walnut tree um, from the project. As far as the proposed project scope, um, the project site is 42.9 acres. Um, it does include four residential buildings, uh, a parking structure, uh, a four-story parking structure on the southwestern portion of the property, uh, 264 units of those 264 units, 34 would be affordable. Uh, the project also includes subterranean parking for the residential structures um, and also surface level parking for both the industrial portion of the project and also the residential portion of the project. Um, as previously mentioned, the project does include oak and landmark tree encroachments and removals, and again, a, a land division to subdivide the property into two lots, and also a specific plan. Here's the vicinity map of the project site. Um, as this aerial photograph demonstrates, the subject uh, site is, on the, is located within the eastern portion of the city uh, limits. Here's the aerial uh, photograph of the subject property, um, giving you a, 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 an idea and sense of the project site and the surrounding development. Uh, to the east, you have Lakeview Canyon Road. To the south, you have the 101 freeway. Um, and to the west, beyond the promenade at Westlake, you have Westlake Boulevard. And to the north, you have uh, Thousand Oaks Boulevard. And as this aerial photograph demonstrates, you have an existing industrial building at the uh, southern portion of the subject site, and you have surface level parking within the northern portion of the property. Um, as far as existing conditions of the subject site, um, there is an existing industrial office building um, referred to as One Baxter Way. Um, it totals approximately 416,000 square feet and was built in the 1980s. Um, it does provide for 1,245 uh, surface level parking spaces on the subject property. Uh, there is an expansive lawn area um, that's characterized by a steep slope and uh, mature trees that are basically existing between the existing industrial building and the 101 freeway. Um, the site is already improved, um, has existing infrastructure, there's sewer, water, and storm drains on the subject property. Um, the site is served by two existing access driveways along Lakeview Canyon Road, and there is an existing bridge um, along the western portion of the site uh, that provides access to the uh, promenade to the west. Um, there are uh, sidewalks on both sides of that existing bridge. Here's an aerial photograph um, demonstrating the surrounding land uses. Um, on the, uh, around the project site. Um, identified here in the uh, pink circle is where the proposed uh, four multifamily residential buildings will be located on the northern portion of the property. Um, the, per, the orange square on the southwestern uh, portion of the site is where the proposed uh, four-story parking structure will be located. Um, to the north, you have Thousand Oaks Boulevard. Uh, you have beyond that open space, and you have a school to the northeast, and beyond that, you have some open space. You do have existing industrial uses um, uh, to the east beyond Lakeview Canyon Road, and you do have the 101 freeway to the south, and you have the existing uh, commercial uses at the promenade to the west, and then Westlake Boulevard beyond that. The uh, blue circles here identified on this aerial photograph are existing um, bus locations that are near the, the subject property. Again, this is demonstrating the proposed concept for this uh, multifamily residential development within close proximity of public transit and also various commercial uh, and industrial uses uh, nearby. Here's an existing view of the subject property as you see it from Thousand Oaks Boulevard. Um, this is looking towards the south. Um, so this is the area where you would have um, uh, the uh, proposed multifamily residential building beyond those uh, existing trees that are on the perim perimeter of the site. Here's an existing view of the subject property for, as you see it from Lakeview Canyon Road uh, towards the west uh, where you see um, here the mature landscaping that's existing all around the perimeter of the property and the various trees on the subject site. Um, where you see the vehicles uh, parked currently right now is where they propose multifamily residential buildings would be sited. Um, towards the left, you can see here beyond the mature landscaping is the existing industrial office building known as Baxter Way. Here's an existing view of the subject property to give you some perspective as it's um, viewed from the 101 freeway. Uh, this is going uh, northbound on the 101, um, looking at the subject site. There you can see the existing industrial office building, um, the expansive lawn area that it's a buffer between the 101 and the existing industrial building. Um, on the left-hand side, you know, you see the existing mature landscaping along the perimeter of the site. As far as background on the, on the project, 
the city council allocated the um, 264 units uh, on the subject property in February of 2021. Uh, thereafter, um, the applicant team submitted the pre-application um, with the revised set of project plans. Um, in June of 2021, the, the applicant team and staff met um, to provide comments on the proposed project and make all the necessary revisions to um, bring the project in, in alignment with the city's uh, code standards ordinances and also city council's direction. In August of 2021, the formal application was submitted with additional modifications to the plans. In November of 2021, um, the kickoff meeting did occur with ESA to get started on the, on the project EIR. And then in February of, of this year, uh, we had the scoping meeting on the project. And then in April 15th of this, of this year, we circulated the draft EIR for public comment, which expired on May 31st. And then here we are today um, before the Planning Commission for a, a recommendation to the City Council. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we did um, receive the allocation on the site for the num to total number of units of 264. Since that time um, in, in 2021, the applicant has worked uh, diligently to make sure that we make um, the necessary revisions, not only provided by staff and the public, but also um, as directed by City Council. Um, so what the applicant did in order to make those modifications to the project, uh, they increased the affordable component from 29 affordable units to 34 uh, units. They included a learning and tutoring room um, for the residential component of the project. And they also include enhanced sustainable features um, for the proposed project. Here's um, an overview of where we are tonight. Um, this, this, uh, this is demonstrated graphically here to, um, to show the many steps in the planning review process. The initial step was the pre-screening where the 264 units were allocated. <clears throat> allocated. Thereafter, the pre-application was submitted to iron out development requirements and project specifics. Then the formal development application was submitted um, and the project was further refined. Thereafter, staff began the environmental review stage and proceeded with the draft EIR. At the end of this process, um, the Planning Commission will make a recommendation to the City Council and then the City Council would hold a public hearing and take final action on the project. Uh, as far as a project overview and the details, um, here's the a project site plan. Um, again, it's a 42.9 acre site. Um, on the southern portion of the property, you have the 40, the 34.1 acres on one on one parcel, which is parcel two, um, planning area two, where you see the existing industrial office building and the expansive lawn area, and where the proposed four-story parking structure would be located um, on the southwestern portion of the property. Towards the northern portion of the property, you have the four um, multifamily residential buildings. As you can see here, at the northernmost portion of the property, you have building um, building B. Uh, which is a three-story uh, multifamily residential structure. And then um, just to the southeast of that, you have Building A, um, which is the also three-story um, residential multi, uh, multifamily residential development. Uh, there is subterranean parking um, exclusively for these uh, multifamily residential units that are below the um, residential component. And you have access to the site off of Lakeview Canyon Road as demonstrated here. Uh, you do have a main access road um, that bisects the property between the multifamily residential apartments and the proposed parking structure. Also, as shown here, you have Thousand Oaks Boulevard to the north, you have the West Lake Promenade to the west, and you have an existing um, bridge that provides uh, access to the west there. Here is the uh, conceptual landscape plan. Um, as the conceptual landscape plan demonstrates, you have the with the proposed project, some amenities include a uh, poolside terrace. Uh, you also have residential uh, common areas. You have an expansive um, pocket park in between the multifamily residential and the parking structure uh, provided. You have various trails that um, bisect the property connecting the, the um, pedestrians from not only the project site to the promenade, but also to Lakeview Canyon Road. Uh, you also have uh, community gardens proposed and you have a resident dog park. Um, so um, staff would like to indicate that the actual dog park for this project and all the other open space amenities are exclusively um, for the residents of the multifamily residential development and not open to the public. Um, staff would also like to note that all the landscaping and irrigation improvements shall be designed and installed in accordance with the city's guidelines and sta standards for landscape and planting and irrigation. 
All landscape plans shall demonstrate compliance with the state uh, California model water efficiency landscape ordinance known as MWILO. And um, prior to issuance of a grading permit and building permits, um, the applicant would, would be required to complete landscape and irrigation plans reflecting compliance with all imposed conditions um, of the project entitlements um, for review. Here's um, a floor plan um, demonstrating the um, proposed unit, unit types for the multifamily residential. Um, the project includes uh, 67 studio apartments, 119 one-bedroom apartments, and 78 two-bedroom apartments. Um, on the right-hand side is a typical floor plan um, of the multifamily residential use. Uh, as demonstrated here, you have a rooftop deck, various units that have private balconies um, provided for the proposed project. As far as the affordable component of the project, uh, the project does include 34 affordable uh, units, uh, 16 in the very low income category and 18 in the low income category. Um, these affordable units are required to be dispersed throughout the entire um, development, the residential development um, at each floor level. Uh, as far as the project components um, and conditions of approval, we did apply a affordable housing agreement, which provides an ongoing affordability um, of the units to 55 years. And um, staff would like to note that the applicant is providing 34 affordable units, um, but they are not proposing a density bonus uh, with this proposed project. As far as the parking, um, the multifamily residential component requires 435 parking spaces. 435 uh, will be provided. Um, those are all uh, tied to the, not only the subterranean parking, but also to the surface level parking um, for the proposed project. And the project also includes 102, 132 guest parking spaces. Um, as far as the existing um, industrial office uh, uh, building and the proposed four-story parking structure, uh, that parking structure will provide for 925 parking spaces. Um, so the proposed structure and surface level parking will equal 1,279 spaces. Um, that's 34 more spaces than were allocated um, for the existing industrial um, building. As far as the general plan amendment, um, again, the subject property is currently uh, designated industrial. Um, the proposed uh, a general plan amendment includes a change uh, for the 8.8 .8 acre portion of the property identified here in the um, purple polygon uh, for high density residential to accommodate the proposed multifamily residential use. The southern portion of the site where you have planning area two, where you have the existing industrial building and the proposed parking structure is gonna be um, industrial. And then the zone change would be from, from um, M1 to SP23. As far as the specific plan goes, um, you know, this, this SP23, uh, the Oaks uh, specific plan was designed to provide pedestrian and bicycle friendly development, um, again, to provide the connectivity with surrounding properties nearby. Um, there are specific development standards included uh, for the high density uh, residential designation on the 8.8 .8 acre planning area one. And we do also have a planning area two uh, with, us, with custom development standards for any proposed um, industrial development um, and also the ex a proposed parking structure. As far as the, um, the impacts to protected trees um, resulting from the project, um, the project site supports 430 protected trees, which include 325 oak trees, 104 sycamore trees, and one black walnut tree. The, project, the proposed project includes the removal of 31 uh, protected trees. Um, of those, it's uh, three coast live oaks, uh, two valley oaks, and 26 sycamores. The removals are a result of the proposed residential structures outlined here in the red square and the four parking uh, structures uh, or the four-story parking structure outlined in the red circle. The project also includes encroachment into the protected zone of 63 oak trees, uh, 35 of those are, um, and 35 sycamores and one black walnut. Uh, due to the 31 uh, removals, the project will require um, 93 replacement trees. Of these, 40, uh, of these um, replacement trees, 47 will be planted on site and 46 would be planted off site. As indicated in the findings and conditions of approval um, provided to the Planning Commission in the, uh, in the resolution, 
If the site cannot accommodate the planting of all the required mitigation trees, the Community Development Department Director may approve planting of the trees at an off-site location for public benefit or provide an in-lieu cash payment to the city's open space endowment fund. Therefore, with the inclusion of the recommended conditions, this request uh, will not be contrary to or in conflict with the general purpose of the city's oak tree ordinance and oak tree preservation and protection guidelines. Here's an um, elevation of the proposed uh, multifamily residential. Um, as demonstrated here, uh, the average building height for building A is approximately 34 feet. The architecture is a contemporary modern style with building materials that include smooth stucco finish, um, cement and metal panel siding, large expansive and multi-pane uh, windows, recessed vinyl windows, decorative window trim, roof cornice and transparent panel railing. The proposed buildings incorporate roofline variation and vertical and horizontal articulation designed to reduce the building size, mass and scale while maintaining compatibility with the existing surrounding um, development. Uh, here's the elevation of the uh, proposed four-story parking structure. Um, on the top, you see the structure facing south toward the 101 freeway and the elevation below facing towards the promenade. Uh, as shown here, the proposed four-story parking structure is designed to be compatible with the existing industrial office a building uh, that's located on the subject site and will be at an average height not to exceed 50 feet. Here are some renderings um, that are pro uh, provided uh, for the proposed project to give a better sense of the proposed development um, as it would uh, be um, designed for the subject site. Here's a view of the subject property looking towards the northeast from the internal portions of the site um, along the western portion of the property. Um, on the left-hand side, you see the, the multifamily residential buildings identified in the, um, in the orange. And then you have the uh, pocket parks that are located between the parking structure and the multifamily residential with that main access road bisecting the property. And then you have the industrial office building um, there to the um, southeast. Here's another visual rendering to give a better perspective of what the project, -like, uh, project would look like from the um, vantage point of Thousand Oaks Boulevard and Lakeview Canyon Road. This is looking towards the south. As you see here, you have the existing perimeter um, mature landscaping that's on the subject property, and beyond that, you would have the three-story residential building. Here's another rendering from the internal portion of the property. Um, this is within the open space courtyard areas um, between the multifamily residential buildings. Um, again, this, this demonstrates the, um, the robust amount of open space that's been provided um, for the residents on the subject property. You have balconies overlooking the courtyards, you have rooftop terraces, um, and you also have uh, uh, various um, open space uh, dog park amenities and also the pocket park there to the south um, between the parking structure and the proposed multifamily residential. As far as the environmental review process goes, um, as mentioned earlier, um, in November of 2021, um, staff did have the kickoff meeting uh, with ESA to start the project. Um, it's basically to confirm objectives and to establish the protocol as we move forward with the environmental review of the project. We then had the scoping meeting in um, January of this year. Uh, again, that was to gather input from all the stakeholders um, to include into the environmental analysis. Uh, staff did uh, prepare the draft EIR and then it was circulated on April 15th with an, um, for a comment and review period ending in May 31st of this year. And then um, the, the final EIR CEQA findings um, were provided to the Planning Commission for their review and consideration as they provided recommendation to the City Council and then City Council would take final action on that final EIR. As far as the development agreement goes, um, there are various uh, deliverables and expectations resulting from this project, um, uh, specific affordable unit count, sustainability components, and other amenities. Um, it, they all, the development agreement also sets a seven-year term for construction of the project. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the applicant team, team did include other components into the development agreement, which include uh, learning and tutoring room for the children, uh, also electric appliances for all units, and also 34 affordable units with no density bonus. So as far as the project components and consistency with the general plan, um, the, pro the proposed project is consistent with the general plan as, a, as proposed. It's consistent with the um, SP23 and any applicable city standards and policies. 
Um, the proposed project is compatible with surrounding land uses. Um, the project has been designed to minimize visual impacts to surrounding properties. And the project um, will not be detrimental to pub public health, sa safety, and welfare as a project was reviewed by the city, um, public works, planning, um, and other um, uh, various agencies and departments, including the fire department, um, for review and consideration. Um, and for the recommendation, um, staff does recommend that the Planning Commission consider the draft EIR prepare for the project and recommend to the City Council that they adopt a certified final EIR in accordance with CEQA and recommend approval of the subject applications based on the findings and subject to the suggested conditions of approval included in the draft resolution and ordinances provided to the Planning Commission. That concludes staff's presentation. Um, staff is available for any uh, questions, comments from the commission, and um, staff also has the um, project EIR consultant available. Mr. Contreras, thanks very much for your report. Commissioners, are there questions or comments of staff? Commissioner Lanson. Thank you, Chair. I just never want to know if I should go first or wait till the end. Um, Mr. Contreras, thank you again for your report. Uh, it, very thorough. It seems like we've we've been here before, uh, <laughs> actually five days ago. Um, one thing that I, I did note, and you actually have a specific heading uh, or comment in the report, uh, is that you received no comments from neighbors. Um, is that still the case? Um, at the time staff prepared, prepared the staff report, we did not receive those um, comments from various uh, neighbors, but as the report was published um, after uh, June, um, June 8th, uh, we did receive a supplemental um, uh, information and correspondence after the report was published. So yes, that is why the Planning Commission received a supplemental packet with various um, correspondence provided by the public after the report was published. And I know the, the two supplements we got, um, I, I know there was one that we even got uh, from Mr. Dugan later in the afternoon. Um, I didn't see anything that was necessarily, uh, had raised concerns with regard, I know there was the Carpenter group that was uh, making a comment, but I didn't see anything that was negative, did you? Um, staff did not uh, take note of anything negative as far as the comments that were received. Um, we did receive a lot of letters of support on the project. Um, we did receive a couple of comments um, regarding the, um, the draft EIR. However, the comment and review period did expire on May 31st, and staff is taking those comments on the EIR into consideration to further evaluate ahead of, ahead of City Council. Um, thank you. Uh, one question, again, this is probably for the applicant. What is the long-term prognosis as to the use of the industrial building, if you know? Um, from what I understand, and um, as far as the SP23 is concerned, the existing, the existing industrial office building will remain. Um, that is a, a large component of planning area too. Um, again, that is why the applicant is proposing that four-story parking structure is to accommodate the parking for the uses that would go into that industrial building. Um, and I know um, looking at this kind of like I did last time and looking, looking at the issues, um, uh, parking, you said that that's not an issue based upon our current codes. Uh, by the way, one question, I guess, uh, this zoning that's seeking tonight would be in, in compliance or be, uh, would be consistent with the um, zoning that we would have as part of the general plan update, is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Um, the subject site where you have the, um, the 8.8 .8 acres is designated um, as mixed use, uh, 30 units of the acre as part of the endorsed land use plan. Uh, and uh, parking again. You have the. You indicated that it provides for a sufficient parking based upon our current codes. I'll, I'll ask the the question as if I didn't know the answer from five days ago. But from VMT and and uh, other information, does it comply with our current codes? As I look down the dais. Yeah. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, Nader Hadari, city engineer. And yes, that is correct. The. VMT for this project is uh, lower than the citywide VMT. The VMT uh, projected for this project is 8.99, which is much lower than the citywide average VMT for this uh, this portion of town. And, and again, that that makes uh, that passes the uh, the smell test. But considering that they're right adjacent to many uh, services and uses and errands that can be run with just uh, you know, walking across the uh, the bridge there to the promenade and to the North Ranch Plaza and everything, so. Uh, while, while I have you, Mr. Adar, you're going to say probably something you said before <laughs> last week. Um, again, one argument is why, why are we building more units when we have no water? Yes, yes, that's certainly uh, probably the number one question. And 
again, the, the there is a need for housing. Uh, everyone's aware that there's a housing emergency in the state of California, and so that that is uh, a baseline issue. The drought is kind of a more recent phenomenon, obviously, that we're dealing with. And uh, what we do know is this new housing stock that is built is much more efficient and uses much less water on a gallons per capita basis than the older traditional uh, housing stock that was built in the 60s and 70s uh, throughout town here. So. Um, the uh, is much more efficient usage, and we need to provide this housing for our existing residents and existing employees uh, throughout town. Uh, one thing I know that came up last week as well was uh, EV charging stations. Um, what does the plan provide, to your knowledge? Um, as far as the proposed uh, EV charging stations, um, right now the proposed project includes up to 5% EV ready, uh, which is a total of 22 spaces. Um, and they also are providing for up to 6% uh, uh, EV capable for the new industrial parking garage, um, which would amount to 56 uh, parking spaces. Okay, I think we, we, we may want additional clarification that we'll get uh, probably from the applicant. Correct. Um, I noticed in one of the letters from the coalition they were looking for rooftop solar. Uh, that's not provided for in the current plans, correct? Um, that is proposed um, as far as the project uh, components go. And uh, um, additionally to that, we did include a sustainable features component as part of the development agreement, which outlines a lot of these sustainable components, including um, solar panels. Uh, and then I'll ask the, the Measure E question. So, and I know, Mr. Kearns, you gave me last, uh, the last meeting. We have 55 left. I'm assuming that's after both the allocation from last project and this project as well, correct? That is correct. That's remaining uh, citywide. So these, again, these units have already been allocated by the City Council? Yeah, this project was allocated 264 units. Um, I, I think we'll ask the applicant with regard to the Carpenter letter, um, assuming that's something that will go to them. Um, I think that's all I have for the moment. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Commissioner McMahon. Yes, um, I did drive the property, and I just want confirmation. The perimeter road um, and the road that bisects the property, those are going to remain the, the way they are? Um, the proposed project includes some modifications to the internal circulation, again, because uh, you have existing surface level parking. And in order to construct a, the multifamily residential and the parking structure, it would call for some circulation changes. Um, we do have the um, project architect here that can talk a little bit more about the proposed design uh, for that internal access and circulation. Um, but yeah, that has been reviewed and um, vetted by not only Public Works, but also by Ventura County Fire Department. Oh, that leads to my other question. Um, in the event of an evacuation, there's basically one road out plus the little road on the bridge, and the fire department thinks all the residents can be evacuated and the people in the offices? Uh, that is correct. The, again, the proposed project was reviewed by Ventura County Fire and they approved of the, um, the circulation plan, um, uh, vehicle ingress and egress for the proposed project. Okay, so um, now this one is a kind of an interesting question. I'm, on our packet, our original packet on page 14, they talked about the different in, uh, intersections and the, the level, and the last three were... Um, were corrected in our supplemental, where they, they were originally, they would not op operate within City of Thousand Oaks performance criteria, C or better. And at, in the original one, it said that the applicant was going to pay traffic mitigation fees. And now in our supplement, it says that those three are actually, those three intersections will actually be compliant so does that mean that those traffic mitigation fees go away? Yes, I can help address that one. Um, yeah, those those three, those final three, which had, which had a not in the sentence, it was a typo, so we removed that not. But the applicant is still required to pay the citywide traffic impact fee, which pertains not only to the you know intersections right adjacent, but citywide and uh, Westlake Boulevard and Thousands Boulevard and so forth. So that that is a citywide traffic impact fee that they will be contributing. Okay, and then um, one more question about the bridge. It seems that it's not pedestrian friendly, really, and will that be changed? Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the proposed project does not include um, any modifications to the existing bridge. That would require, um, that wasn't something that was assessed or evaluated during the, the environmental review of the project, so we wouldn't be able to do that right now. 
Um, but based on the project design and the existing um, improvements on, for the bridge, it, can, it, it does provide for pedestrian access and vehicle access. So I understand that there are no modifications required for that bridge. Um, as a matter of fact, it can provide for you a photograph of the existing conditions to verify um, the, the existing conditions of that bridge. Um, it's right here before you in the, in the PowerPoint. Uh, here you can see the project site um, you have the existing industrial office building, the surface level parking um, in the western property line. Mm -hmm. There in the green um, um, arrow, we have the limits of the of the um, or the location of the of the of the existing bridge. And on the left hand side, you have the a photograph of that bridge taken not more than a couple of months ago, um, demonstrating vehicular access and also pedestrian um, access um, to the subject site. Okay, I guess I missed the pedestrian access there when I was over there. Um, and um, the solar, is that going to be enough to power um, all four residential buildings? Um, I don't have the uh, specific answer to that. Um, I would defer that to the applicant team and their architect. Okay, and one last question and then I'm done um, for now. Um, how tall is the existing industrial office building? Can you repeat that question again? How tall is the existing industrial office building? Just, I wanted to compare it to the other height of the other buildings. Um, I, I don't have that information for you at this moment. Um, I could try to get that information for you and then get you that number. That'd be great, thank you. And I'm done. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Buzz. Thank you, Chair. Uh, great presentation. Uh, Mr. Contreras, I, uh, actually, can we start with the uh, picture of the bridge again real quick? I want to follow up on that. So we're saying that there's pedestrian access on this bridge, but I'm looking at the very near uh, bottom, I guess that's the bottom right-hand corner, and I see the sidewalk ends. So my question becomes, <laughs> we're saying this is pedestrian accessible? Um. It is. I don't, I'm not sure if it would be at this point right now. We would require any ADA um, modifications, um, and I'd have to look at the at the photograph of the um, of the bridge on the on the north side. Uh, yeah. I don't I don't recollect whether or not there's a ramp there um, yeah. on uh, yeah. that side. It, it's just uh, this is an experiential thing that I found walking throughout my city is that uh, we've got a lot of sidewalks that go to nowhere and and stop cold. Um, I happen to live at the corner of uh, Jans and Moore Park. And uh, when you're walking to the Ralph Shopping Center over there, it's kind of the same thing. We, I got a sidewalk, and then all of a sudden I'm in the street fighting with traffic over how I'm getting to the shopping center itself once I get into the entrance. So I, I think that this is something that planning needs to consider when we're, when we're talking about these issues going forward especially, because I find myself, I, I am a person who prefers to be a pedestrian, and I keep running into spaces where I'm like, this is a sidewalk literally to nowhere. And I'm 6'4", 300 pounds, so cars notice me, but often I have my children with me, and uh, I keep them very close to me because it's, it's a little nerve-wracking to walk around on, on public streets when you've got children. And I'm thinking in terms of this development, we're talking about an area that children will be able to access, you know, go over to the bookstore, go over for, for a milkshake, whatever, and uh, I want to make sure that, uh, that we're thinking about them. So um, I'll, I'll leave that... Uh, for you guys to follow up on. I know that we're not the uh, traffic commission. Um, uh, I'll go with my other questions. Um, they're not asking for a density bonus, um, and, but the number of affordable units did go up after consultation. Can you give me a little behind the scenes on what that thought process was and why they made those, why, why they increased the number of uh, affordable units? Um, yes. Um Back when the project was uh, allocated the residential units of 264, um, uh, the applicant did take into consideration um, impacts to surrounding properties and also comments from the city council on the project's density, right? So to stay within the city's um, goals and objectives and also while providing for the appropriate density on the property, they increased the affordable component to also meet the city's housing needs um, for affordable component. Um, that was strictly something that the applicant team saw and heard as far as the comments, not only from the council, but also from the public uh, on that project when they got allocated units. Okay, so this is solely a goodwill gesture on their part in order to, for, for the community benefit. 
Um, that is correct. Uh, again, after after the project was allocated units, um, applicant met with the staff, and we went back to the drawing board and recommended um, all the modifications and changes to the project, and that was one of the components that came up. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, just a quick question. We were saying that um, the uh, parks and all that stuff, and kind of the, the area itself, that's the residential area, is not open to the public. Um, will this be gated somehow, or is it, what's, what's, what's the... Yeah, um, the proposed project, um, as demonstrated on the project plans, it does indicate uh, uh, perimeter fencing. Um, there is uh, uh, restricted access right now on the subject site, and the applicant team can give you a little bit more information as far as um, um, yeah, gated the access. The reason I'm asking is, site. would it be just the, the buildings itself, or are we talking about the parking areas as well? Because that bridge access would be one of the things that could potentially be impacted by, uh, by gating the uh, residential area. So that's what I'm asking. I, I don't. I didn't see in the pictures, and I'm just trying to get wrap my head around how 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 we how this becomes a, a semi-private area. Uh, yeah, um, access to the site is restricted um, to the actual uh, project site at the perimeters. So the residential component and the existing industrial building, there will be no gated access between the two. But there, the, the gated access right now that you see at the bridge would remain um, unmodified. And then you're going to have restricted access along the perimeter where you saw those um, perimeter oak trees. It does include some perimeter fencing okay, so to I, restrict access to the subject site. I'm, I'm, I'm not fault. So there, there, there's a, a, like a, a draw arm on that bridge right now, but it's open. I, I drove on it today. So that's not, and, and that's not going to stop anybody <laughs> so it's uh, okay so so but we're not anticipating a fence being built or anything like that yeah all the the existing just, the, just some existing kind of you know yeah correct at, at the bridge you have the existing gate there are no proposed modifications to that gate yeah this uh, is going to be like Lindmere or something like that like a neighborhood where it's fully gated in and everything well, it, it is, um, and I'll let the applicant team um, elaborate a little bit further on the um, site security. Um, okay. To get access to the property, it, it was rather difficult for me um, a couple of, a couple of uh, months ago. Um, I'm not sure if now they just have the gate opened. Um, but but um, <laughs> as far as I'm just the, not good at observing signs that say "Don't go here." <laughs> All right. All right, we'll move along. Um, so we talked a lot about parking spaces. I was just curious. Um, we did another. Uh, project not too long ago in the same vicinity and uh, the developer was talking a lot about bike parking I was just curious if we've been considering any of that either for the industrial space or for the I, I don't necessarily think for the for the residential they'll probably bring their bikes into their homes or but uh, is, is there is there any provision for bike parking uh, there is. Uh, the project includes um, not only conditions of approval requiring the bike parking, there are bike corrals proposed in the residential parking structures as well. Sweet. And, and also um, uh, bicycle parking in the common areas as well. I apologize for missing that in the uh, draft. Um, off topic, there's a three-car garage that's currently in that parking lot. What was that for? What is that for? In the, it's it's literally where everything's going to be built now. There's uh, I think it's, it's, it's a mound. It's got uh, turf over it, and then there's three uh, three garage entrances there. I believe it's the Verizon the existing. Was oh. that the Verizon maintenance yard way back? In the I day? thought it was a Verizon maintenance yard a while okay. ago, and but I'll let um, the applicant team who um, is currently operating the existing site um, give you oh, a little bit more detail as to what's operating out of there right now. Shout out to my brother who worked for uh, Atlantic Bell slash Verizon. Um, and then uh, trees, um, on the, the, the in lieu fees we talked a little bit. So they're saying 46 on-site, 47 off-site. Those can be offset by the in lieu fees to, uh, to the city. Uh, the 46 that are committed to be planted, though, those cannot be just paid for and then ignored, right? They have to actually plant those 46 that are, they are committed to. It's the off-site ones that are optional? Yeah, that is absolutely correct. Um, okay. We are going to require that they provide um, uh, replacement trees on the subject site. It's just that there are limitations to the um, development area and yeah. where the trees could be located. So and we decided that 46 is their minimum number? Is 46 is what the um, applicant team um, when or what we, they determined when we designed would, would it? Sufficient. Yeah, part of the part of the, um, per, uh, the also the tree evaluation that we went through um, for this project, uh, we determined that the 46 would be the appropriate amount to provide on site. Okay, and and everybody's good with that, and that cannot be countermanded with an in lieu fee later, correct? Uh, that is correct. Okay, perfect. Uh, let's see. 
Um, I, I just had one last question. I, I might act, actually be for the applicant. Um, this is the second time in a week I've heard about a children's like community room area. Is this uh, a, a new marketing thing? Is this a, a defined thing in terms of the city? Do we have like rules on what this is? Because I, I was just curious, is this a place where children can go unsupervised? Is there adult supervision there that's provided by the, by the uh, apartment complex? Like what is it exactly? And, and, and because I'm asking, because could conceivably adults who have their own businesses work in there and use it as a, like a semi-office space? What is it? Uh, yeah, I mean, as we work with the applicant team to come up with all the amenities on the subject property, um, we look at the city's uh, needs and also just the project components and what the um, proposed project would require as far as the market needs from the applicant team. And again, they can talk to why they designed it in this way. But just like we, we think about the ride sharing component and um, you know, providing a location for people to be dropped off and pick up, uh, we're looking at this uh, tutoring and learning center as something as an amenity for the residents to have because it's something, again, we, we take into consideration the project's location. There is a school nearby. And we know uh, as far as um, letting the applicant team know and getting comments from the public, we want to take into consideration that component and what's nearby and provide this tutoring and learning center because ultimately the idea would be if um, somebody's child uh, is at school and they have to uh, work on a, a specific project, they'd have the facility there to be able to collaborate and provide for a tutoring environment or learning environment. Okay. Um, the, the, the primary reason I ask is because it, um, we have a number of two bedroom apartments, but otherwise it's studios and in, in one bedrooms. I don't, I don't see a lot of high school students renting their own apartments and living here. So it, it, it just seems like a, a weird um, component to it in my head. Uh, yes, and, you know, if, if, they had, if they had labeled it a clubhouse or something like that, like we did in the 80s, then that's what I'm trying to figure out. Is this just a, a rebranding of that concept of the community room, the clubhouse, the whatever? Um, I don't believe it's a rebranding, but I'll let the applicant team um, give you a little bit more specifics as to what the components are and the details on that tutoring and learning a room that's going to be proposed okay. on I'll, the project. I'll them. I really appreciate your time, sir. Thank you. I want to follow up about the uh, zoning. Uh, you indicated that um, currently and under, under the general plan update, uh, this is classified uh, mixed use. Um, is it, it's mixed use low, correct? Under under the GPU. Uh, sorry, yes, it is. It is um, mixed use low under the endor endorsed uh, land use map. Okay, so it's consistent with what we approved and what the city council approved last year. That is correct, and again, the 8.8 um, .8 acres is designated for the high-density residential, and then you have the industrial portion on the southern side. All right. The staff report references a berm, pretty large berm, like 20, 25 feet, um, dividing the property from the 101 freeway. Is that is that berm natural, or is it constructed? Um, based on the historical uh, civil plans that staff reviewed as we prepared the environmental review of the project and all, all the other components, yes, um, that, that subject uh, slope was manufactured. Um, it's part of a fill that was um, done as part of the um, original development. Okay. Would it be a fair statement to say then that this, this property was already in a disturbed state, that it, that it, it had been manufactured, as you said? For the pre for the existing building, uh, a great great question, Com Commissioner Newman. Um, yes, that's absolutely correct. The site was previously developed. Um, again, um, you have the residential component um, proposed on the existing surface level parking, and also the parking structure. And you have the existing Baxter Way building with all the manufactured slopes that were previously um, constructed at that time. All right. Um, parks, regarding parks, where is the closest um, city park where kids could throw a ball around? Um, I, d I don't have the specific location of the nearest uh, city park, but um, as I showed in the aerial earlier, uh, there is a open space that is about, I say about 300 feet um, north of the, of, uh, of the northern property line. You have that open space and trails across Thousand Oaks Boulevard. I have a tough, I've actually walked that open space. Um, I have a tough time imagining throwing a ball very far in that space. Um, if, uh, what, um, 
We, okay, so we're not sure where, where a park is. Mr. Hidari, see your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, the, uh, Russell Park uh, is less than a mile from the subject site, and it's just, uh, I think, uh, one, or, one or two blocks up West Lake Boulevard, and they're left on Cascade. So that's uh, in, in relative proximity to the, to the uh, subject site. Okay, and that, that has some open fields, correct? Yes. Right. Okay, great. Um, I see Mr. Friedel's on our speaker list, so perhaps this is a question for him, but, but does the development agree agreement, it makes a general reference to fees and then it enumerates many different departments that may receive many different fees, but I'm asking specifically, does, does this project include payment to CRPD for, for park fees? since we will be adding more residents to the city if we proceed. Um, there is a specific condition of approval that requires the applicant to pay the Quimby fee, yes. Great. Okay, great. Um, you made a reference in your presentation to uh, where part of this proposal is adopting a new specific plan, 23, that, uh, quote, um, quote re just reading back, quote, provide pedestrian and bicycle-friendly development is a goal of SB 23. And the EIR also says, quote, um, this, this will, quote, will reduce car trips and promote walkability. But the EIR also says that this project will introduce 1,375 new car trips every day on Thousand Oaks Boulevard. And I think it's, I'm, I'm not sure if it's a net or a total, but, but there's, 1,279 parking spaces. So a pretty significant new volume of cars. My question is, how is that consistent with a more pedestrian and bicycle friendly development? Um, that's based on the existing characteristics of subject properties nearby. I mean, again, you have public transit nearby, you have industrial uses across Lake Buchanan Road, you have commercial uses, um, commercial office uses to the north across TOB, you have an existing promenade to the west. Um, part of the project design, not only looking at it from the components that are proposed, providing pedestrian connectivity and bicycle friendly design from the actual SP23, but it's also looking at siting this project. And one of the reasons why the units were allocated um, back in 2021 was because this location did fit an area that would provide for that walkability and um, pedestrian friendly and bicycle friendly component. Okay, so it is accurate, yes, that, that the EIR um, estimates um, 1,375 new daily trips, new ADTs on Thousand Oaks Boulevard, but we're saying it is more walkable because of its location and because of its proximity to markets, stores, restaurants, other amenities, where you don't have to get in a car and drive. Uh, that is correct. So both, thing, both things are true. It is more car trips, but there are more things you can do without getting in the car. Uh, that is correct. All right, all right. There's also a reference in um, the staff report to infrastructure improvements. And I'm wondering what they are um, what they will cost and how they'll be paid for. Um, infrastructure improvements include, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the internal access uh, and circulation that's going to be proposed for the project, connecting the proposed um, multifamily residential to uh, sewer and water and all the other um, infrastructure that's needed for the, um, not only for the multifamily residential, but also for the proposed parking structure. And all of those fees are, are all of the cost rather are covered by development fees. Uh, that is correct. All right, very good. And then the final set of questions I have are um, next to last, sorry, <laughs> a set of questions is around trees. Um, Commissioner Buss already asked most of my questions, but I'm wondering if we have, this is a standard question I ask anytime we remove an oak tree. Um, do we have an estimate on approximately how many years we're looking at for the, the three to one replacement we're putting in for those trees to grow to the size of the trees that we're taking out. 
Um, I, I don't know the exact um, amount of time that it would take to grow to what the conditions are of those trees at the current moment. Um, those trees were uh, planted as part of the Baxter Way development, right? Surface level um, parking, uh, lot landscaping. Uh, they included the oak trees and sycamore trees. Um, but the project does include, um, you know, for every tree that's removed, you're going to get two 24-inch box trees and one 36-inch box tree. And so, um, I don't, although I don't have the specific time for how long it would take, um, I would suspect that I'd have to um, discuss that with the city's uh, tree consultant to get a better understanding and give you a better number or, or timeline for what it would take to grow to that size that you currently have now. So just in going through the tree report and in walking the property, um, the trees that are scheduled to be removed are all, or, yeah, all, um, their, their diameter at four, four and a half feet above ground level is in the mid-teens. On, on average, it's, it's 14, 13, 12, 14, 16, 16, 12, so mid, mid teens. Um, these are not small trees. Um, I would not be surprised if it's decades we're talking about for these, these replacement trees. And it's great that there's a three to one replacement, but it may be decades to grow to the, to the size of the trees we're removing. Would you concur? I would agree with that. Uh, these trees were all planted as part of the development, so they're not native trees. Um, so basically when they were put in the ground at the time of develop development is how long they took to get, to get to that size. Very good. And is there a, a standard monitor, or not standard or, or, or not, um, is there a monitoring period for these replacement trees to ensure that they do survive to maturity? Uh, yes, um, not only is it part of our oak tree preservation ordinance, but we also have the conditions of approval that are applied that require the monitoring up to five years um, after the planting. Up to five years. Is, is it five years or it's up to? Oh, sorry, five years. Five, five years. Okay. And then my last tree question is, I don't know if it's above ground or, or subterranean, um, but I believe from the large number of trees existing between the promenade and this property, um, especially on the side of the industrial building, there may be an arroyo or a creek running along there. It seems to feed a lot of, uh, of trees. Um, does this project have any impact on that, on that uh, body of water? Um, as far as the um, project goes, the project has been reviewed by Public Works Department to keep um, to ensure the, uh, proper drainage uh, of the property uh, to reduce any impacts on that drainage course. Um, I can defer for any specifics regarding its impacts to that drainage course to Public Works. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, there will be no activities, no grading or any uh, alteration activities in that stream bed channel uh, down there, which is a natural drainage channel that comes all the way in from North Ranch and comes all the way down through. Do we expect any, I understand there's no construction by, by that channel, but do we expect any impact from the project as a whole on, on, this, on this channel? Well, uh, there will be more impervious uh, acreage on the property, so that may increase some drainage, which may provide more water into the channel, but uh, water in channels right now is pretty limited and <laughs> scarce. <laughs> yes, thing. it is. So uh, it will not uh, adversely impact the, uh, the drainage in that channel. Very good. That's, yeah. that's the principal concern yeah. I had. Okay, I think the rest of my questions are for the applicant. Commissioners, are there any other questions of staff? Okay, very good. Well then, we will go to our applicant. We have um, a very large team assembled. Um, you've got 15 minutes among you. Um, I believe the principal speaker is uh, Mr. Dave Eady of Kennedy Wilson um, with Scott Baker of Realm Studio. And then available for questions are Tom Cohen, Daniel Garcia, Keith McCloskey, Ted Fratone, John Moreland, Mark Oberholzer, and Chris Kallstrand. Good evening. Is this on? Okay. It is now. And good, I'm. Good evening. Thank you very much. And I'm representing Kennedy Wilson, uh, who's basically the owner of the property. Uh, tonight, uh, Scott Baker is going to join me uh, with a PowerPoint presentation after I make a few remarks here. Uh, one question. Um, 
to answer all of your questions, it might eclipse our 15 minutes. Can I, uh, can we address those at the end afterwards? Yes, there will be a question and answer period okay, after that your... way we'll address the questions that were asked uh, at first. Yes, sir. Okay. You, you have 15 minutes to present, then there's Q&A, gotcha. then we go back to staff, then you have five more minutes to rebut. Perfect. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to the staff. They, uh, we've worked with them since before the pre-app. Uh, their guidance and uh, the input we've gotten from them has been immeasurably excellent. It's uh, across the board one of the best I've worked with in many, many years in doing this. Uh, I think that the outcome of the staff report speaks for itself. It's uh, in, in effect, I think it speaks that the project is both necessary and appropriate and uh, for the reasons that they went into in much detail. Um, regarding the environment we have here with the existing office building, it presents a number of opportunities and challenges, and uh, opportunities in the sense that it's a great environment that was built. Uh, however, hundreds and hundreds of nursery stock trees were imported, and we have almost 600 trees on the site. So with uh, 11% lot coverage for the project uh, or the existing property that's in uh, that's improved right now uh, There's not a lot of room when you look at all the trees to fit things in there with uh, anything new and the idea of implementing a new project uh, that uh, introduces um, a village atmosphere where you have proximity to live work and uh, go to restaurants and retail opportunities at the promenade. All of that can be done, but there is an expense of trees. But in this case, I think with our focus on day one to minimize the impact on trees by careful planning, uh, in effect, less than 1% of the trees have been taken. And, and I don't know of any other environment in the city that has this dilemma. It's a, that's the challenge part. Um, but in terms of uh, freeway separation, for instance, uh, the new multifamily component is over 1,000 feet from the existing freeway, and it's buffered by the office building or the industrial building. Yet it's freeway close for access, which is uh, just an ideal location. As somebody mentioned earlier about uh, the lack of residential comments tonight, we've been in contact with four residential communities but all of them are over two-thirds of a mile from the property. It's really a unique situation. So I guess if you're talking about infill, this would be a, a you know, a case study for one. I'm uh, also happy to note that there's, as it's been said, there's no unmitigatable impacts. Uh, there's no overriding cons considerations needed. It's consistent with the tree ordinance and poses no noticeable effects with traffic and it comports with the uh, GP 2045 direction you're going in terms of uh, the land use map that you adopted, or it's not adopted yet, but uh, vetted last year, and uh, those sorts of things. So I think everything, is, the project has been, uh, that we've approached has been, you know, in conformance with everything that's being considered right now, even if it's not uh, law yet on the direction the city's going. And now we purposefully uh, did a low element or, or a low type of a low intensity environment, three stories and asking for no density bonus. And that was done to basically fit this project in a way that is not going to cram in units and to take advantage of the density bonus. And yet you have with this proposal with 34 very needed uh, very low and low income units, a true public benefit that is being offered here with no, nothing in return, if you will, which is typically the density bonus. So I'm glad Carlos mentioned that twice tonight. Uh, I guess the last thing I would say that is um, the sustainability uh, issue here is, uh, you saw the letter from the Climate Coalition, we've been working with them I think we've had four or five meetings, and uh, where we are right now on that is uh, exceptional, in, way over any minimum requirements of, uh, of a green, uh, Cal Green or anything like that, and Scott will get into that in more detail. So, so as not to take any more of uh, 
time from Scott, I'm going to let you let him go since we're at nine and a half minutes right now. Thank you, Mr. Eden. Thank you. Good evening, Scott Baker with Realm, Landscape Architects, Urban Designers. I'll try to keep this very brief. Uh, Mr. Contreras did a, a, a remarkable job of laying out all the details and didn't leave a whole lot of surprise for me to add to the conversation. Um, quickly, I'll go through. I think, importantly, this is the site as it remains today, and I think we take our cues from where it sits in the city. The density of buildings in the neighborhood, the acres of surface parking lot, uh, and just how the, how, how the natural landscape has been largely stripped away. And so we take cues from that to really establish a set of guiding principles for this project. And I think the idea that, one, we wanted to create something that integrated seamlessly. It needs to belong here. It needs to be of Thousand Oaks. Dave talked about the scale of the architecture, the role of the landscape. It needs to reinforce what Thousand Oaks is historically and the patterns of landscape and architectural vernacular. We wanted to create that synergy. We wanted to put more uses on one site rather than it being a singular use. So where we have office, we now have housing adjacent to retail. It goes to your questions about you know, having more local tr uh, trips happen on foot or by bike. And that, that importantly, that really is about best practices. Not only to build on those uses, but also on the transit system you have as well and the pattern of, of open space in the neighborhood. We wanted to preserve and expand the native landscape. This is about trees, but it's also about understory and habitat and urban ecology. And so again, trying to stitch more greenery back into the neighborhood. And then finally, this idea of design excellence. It's about compelling, compelling design, but it's about best practices. It's about doing the right thing across the gamut of development. And so as, as Dave mentioned, as we've talked about, the site's roughly 50% surface parking lot at this point in time. That's a huge heat island issue and we can do better than that, and that's what we aspire to do. So as you've seen in the plans, it takes that surface parking lot, it aggregates the parking in an intelligent and simple way, and it adds four new residential buildings, right? 264 units, 34 of those being affordable units. And I think the important thing with this is that it really, again, aggregates complementary uses on the site. It embraces all of those adjacent land uses that exist already. It leverages the transit and, and bike infrastructure that you have in place, and that's really one of the strong suits of Thousand Oaks and its neighborhood. And I think it ultimately addresses an important need for the biotech community, and again, putting housing where the jobs are, et cetera. Hard to see on the screen. I'm hoping your screen's a little bit better, but I think just importantly, we've aggregated the four buildings that make up the residential closely together. We've tried to expand the amount of open space the neighborhood amenity, the community amenity that we're creating here. Certainly there's courtyard spaces within the buildings that sit on top of the parking, but in a larger area of, of terra firma, if you will, that is landscape, that has play areas, that has places for children, dog park, et cetera. Uh, important to note that the site is actually becoming more permeable than it is now. We're actually creating more soft area, more groundwater uh, permeability than it currently is now. It is a softer site going forward than it is now. And we think that's an important piece. Now, obviously, I'm a landscape architect. Trees are near and dear to me. And I think Dave kind of laid out the, the, the conundrum that we find ourselves in. We've talked about the three coast live oaks, the two valley oaks, the 26 sycamores. Uh, and, and the effort really to shape these buildings. I, I think we've all seen projects that put residential buildings in a much more regular configuration. The idea of sort of twisting and turning these buildings to try to navigate the trees to the best of our ability. That said, we are making those removals. So there is a commitment to replacing 93, uh, not providing 93 replacement trees. We are able to, to provide 47 on site. Horticulturally, that's where we think we are comfortable. More than that, ultimately, we start to crowd oaks, we start to crowd sycamores. It's just not good for the trees. And so we're, we're trying to find that sweet spot where we know these trees can prosper. We're keeping them off of the podium areas where they're in terra firma, right? The best possible growing condition that they are, or that they can have, rather. And that the 46 that we can't accommodate, as has been talked about tonight, the idea of, of using the in lieu fee. In, in our minds, these are 46 trees that belong to the community. So can they be provided in other parts of the city? We're certainly in favor of that. We know we can't accommodate them ourselves, so we want to ensure that the city benefits from them at large. 
I mentioned, though, the native landscape. The understory is equally as important as the trees. It's important from a, from a native habitat point of view, urban ecology point of view, heat island point of view, the idea of growing that green tissue within a community to, re, to improve the health of the community. So we've established a drought-tolerant palette, a largely native palette that would support the, la the, the landscape would be comprised of. To, and as I mentioned, increasing permeability as we go from the surface parking lot to what we have now. So. And there was a question that was raised about the riparian corridor, and I think this is appropriate time to raise it. So presently, that surface parking lot drains into that riparian corridor. So you know what goes along with surface parking lots. Going forward, all wa water is captured on site and filtered, and it still ends up being discharged, but it's water that has been cleaned and filtered before it ends up back in the riparian corridor. So I think from that point of view, there's an effort to really enhance or at least improve upon that water source. And then finally, uh, some of the sustainability features uh, that were mentioned. Um, sorry, I have to go to the slightly larger print on my other, other sheet of paper here. So um, we talked about EV parking stations. Certainly there's a commitment to day one having EV parking stations both in the, um, uh, the industrial garage as well as in the residential garages, but also plumbing or sleeving for future expansion of that system in both locations. New solar panels, or excuse me, solar panels on all new buildings. Low E uh, glass for all the residential glazing systems, the windows, Energy Star um, uh, window systems. Utilizing uh, LED lighting, so for, for high efficiency uh, lighting. And of course, just everything relative to heating and cooling, operable windows, you know, solar exposure, using those trees that we're adding for shade and really just looking at how to ensure that these buildings are uh, pass passively sustainable as much as possible. And then finally, uh, using all electric and no fossil fuels for grills and cooktops and the like. So, And then maybe it's fair that we end with water. You asked a very fair question, uh, or, excuse me, uh, Commissioner Larson. Um, the, the, you know, it's interesting that multifamily housing, I think it was pointed out by staff, that uh, multifamily housing actually uses about a third less water than single family dwellings per person. And I think the reality of where our housing needs are and where our communities are going, we're increasing the number of, of multifamily units. So we're very cognizant of that. We know this is a step in the right direction, as well as addressing the housing issue. But certainly in addition to that, we want to use low flow toilets, shower heads, the like. The landscaping, as I mentioned, very drought tolerant, all climate adaptive, low flow, all of the, you know, Cal Green requirements that were rattled off, those are certain part, certainly part and parcel to the landscape. We, we, we deliver irrigation-based controllers, et cetera. Um, our firm uh, prioritizes sustainable landscapes. This is a landscape we're looking to kind of bring the community back. It needs to be water sensitive. We need to be doing the right thing. And again, People often ask, why are we adding trees? Why are we adding landscape when we're in a drought? That actually helps us to hold more moisture in the community. That actually allows us to lower the, the, the median temperature of the ground. It actually is better for us. So having smart landscape is, is how we want to approach this going forward. And then finally, uh, Carlos stole our thunder with the renderings. So I don't have anything new to show you in that regard. Uh, but I think, I think you can see from the renderings that these are low-slung buildings set deeply within the landscape. Uh, the idea of the pedestrian experience, whether it's from a surface lot, I see I got one minute, I know I need, need to let Dave back up here again. All right, um, but the idea of really setting these buildings in a park in a manner of speaking is really the intention here. And that amenity package from those residential courtyards, the views, we wanna really celebrate what it means to live in Thousand Oaks. And then finally, this last image, the idea of fulfilling the campus environment by adding housing along with office. And so I think we've been over the, the summary benefits, but uh, again, the idea that housing is critical to our communities, not just Thousand Oaks, but all of our communities. It's a critical issue. This is, a, it's, this is providing 264 units, 34 of which are for low and very low affordability. Um, and again, bringing housing and retail and jobs together to create a better, more, more cohesive community. It's a walkable community. And with that, we feel that we are offering best practices. We are delivering a sustainable village. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> so. 
All right, we go now to commissioners for questions of the applicant. Commissioner Lanson. Sure. Anybody else want to take it? I'm glad to. Um, <laughs> Uh, thank you for going over your, your application. I do have some questions, and again, it will give you an opportunity to go through uh, some answers. I, I'm going to ask the same question that I, uh, I asked last week of, of you, which is, do you intend to actually build this, or are you just getting the improvements to then sell it? Actually, we do intend to build it. We have, uh, Kennedy Wilson has 37,000 apartments globally, and uh, our uh, platform right now is and for some time has been to build our own product and manage our own product. We hire, of course, local managers, but uh, in an umbrella sense, we do everything ourselves, including building. So these would, would, would be rentals because that's your business model? That's, that's correct. Um, part of the project, and again, it's, it's noteworthy, is that um, you are not asking for a density bonus. I don't know if you know or if staff knows how many additional units would you have been entitled to build had you actually taken advantage of that concept, if you know? 60, I believe it is. And 60 why are, more. why are you abandoning 60 additional? Well, when you do 60 more units and you provide the attendant parking and all of the other things that are space taking on the site, I think personally you get out of the realm of what we were trying to achieve with the low key environment and village effect, if you will, that we're trying to achieve here. I think it just became a different project in uh, terms of look and feel and again the parking issue you know the parking structure right now is on a site at the lower side of the property 26 feet lower than the existing or than the highest point on where the apartments are going to be which is really ideal it's great to have that where nearly all of the structure is invisible from the freeway there'll be some trees that screen it anyway but that whole feel where you have uh, low, low intensity types of uses nestled in, if you will, versus adding 60 more units and then that much more parking was just an estimate of what we wanted to do. Uh, thinking about uh, Chair Newman's comments, it's more of the loaf, I guess, in that sense, in terms of percentage. Um, how long do you think this is going to take to the extent you actually go forward? I think it's in the specific plan in the or the EIR, but basically, uh, if we were to uh, get a favorable outcome here in June from the city. We jump into working drawings and uh, compliance with all the conditions and all of the things that have to take place prior to construction. That would take the remainder of this year and part of next year. I would I would see pulling building permits uh, sometime mid year next year, and then you're looking at a 24 month to 30 32 month building period. I think that's more uh, realistic. I, and the reason I ask is just looking at our, our arena cycle that we're on, uh, realizing from our last meeting, we, we, I, I mentioned that we had had six new units last year in, in total uh, for the city of Thousand Oaks. Uh, looking at the seven-year uh, period, I was just wondering in terms of exactly when that might come online. Uh, you said it sounds like three to four years at a minimum? Yes, 36 to 48 months to all in to bring on 264 units. Uh, there was a comment, uh, I think, uh, Mr. Baker, made about the EV charging stations that would be available in the parking structures and then plumbed. Uh, can you explain what plumbed means so that we all have a better understanding of that? I think uh, basically the 6%, I don't know if that's a minimum or not, but uh, whatever we're doing in terms of uh, actual uh, plug-in ready versus plumbed, to me that means, you know, if, we're, if there's a demand there, it already would exceed the minimum requirements, but uh, to have it plumbed is, you know, an advantageous thing to have in the event there's more demand, and there probably will be. So that would be up to the individual homeowners, it sounds like, to, to then contact whatever service pro provider may be available with regard to that. Plumbing. Or the manager, us, would supplement it. Okay. That, if that it's makes indicated. So you're going to have an on-site manager, right? Yes. Um, the, the, the tree issue, I know some of the trees uh, are going to be replaced on, on site. Um, has there been discussion where the other trees would go? Is there any indication of, uh, I guess that's probably a staff question. Staff uh, talked about that. I don't remember what they said. It's, uh, I think it's medians and parks. Uh, Carlos, maybe you would want to 
expand on that's that. That's okay. We, we can come back we'll, to staff. We'll come yeah. back to staff. Okay. Um, okay. One last question. Again, I'm sorry if I steal Commissioner Buss's uh, question on this issue. Is, is this bridge and the, the walkway, um, it looks like the area that's not, that goes, doesn't go through, isn't on, wouldn't be, quote, unquote, your land. Um, but I don't know if there's a way for you to actually extend that sidewalk on the bridge. Is that something you could look into? There's an existing sidewalk on both sides of the bridge, and that bridge is via an easement that's in our favor. We control that, that bridge. And we, um, I'm not exactly sure how we, we tie in the, the uh, sidewalk, Scott. Well, again, I didn't know if it was something that was far enough where it was Caruso's or the promenade's property in terms of extending that. Yeah, our side's sort of the easy part to connect to it, which is what happens. Oh, okay. We've, we've spoken with the folks at Caruso, and uh, actually, it's kind of funny, because way back when we first started talking about the project, they didn't want to get any design, into any design details because it was so premature. And said, they said, come back to us when you have a project, and then we can start talking about how to you know, feather that into our side. Literally Caruso's the chicken side. of the egg, is that what you're saying? What's that? Literally the chicken of the egg in terms yes, of- Yes, uh, it was. And, um, our company has a great relationship with Caruso, so I mean, it's a, I don't expect that to be a difficult thing to do in terms of uh, coordinating a better, you know, experience there. I, I would think in terms of trying to cre create the compatibility and the synergy between the two, it probably would be something to look at as a productive issue, whether or not it was something we necessarily brought Most up. Most definitely, yeah. Okay, that's all the questions I have, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Buss. All right. Um, <clears throat> So I, I'll, I'll go back to my, my original questions of staff. Um, the concept of, the, of your um, property not being open to the public, uh, what controls do you have, would you have in place for that other than signage? Unlike the uh, IMT site, you know, we have an existing private use. The, pr the property is, uh, in effect, uh, all private property. So it's uh, not going to be conducive to public access other than to have, you know, guests and, uh, uh, you know, visitors to the apartments, friends, whatever. Uh, there'll be signage. There is a series of uh, safeguards put in place by our management that will control, you know, you'll have a roving guard now and then probably. We really haven't defined what yet, but it'll be such that, uh, you know, things are under control, if you will. Okay. Yeah, I, I uh, okay, that sounds good to me. And then uh, the tutoring center, what, what, what is that? You, yeah. <laughs> I'm at a loss, and it's the second time I've heard it in a week, and I, the first time I just kind of let it roll by. Well, so. some of this emanated from our discussion about the number of affordable units and, uh, you know, and, and uh, having uh, units available to teachers, for instance. And wouldn't it be nice to have a place within the community center, the activity center, the, the main place of gathering for the apartments, to have uh, at least a room where a teacher could book uh, an appointment with the student and uh, tutor him. You know, so it's, it's not a difficult thing to do. It's not uh, an all-inclusive uh, learning center or anything like that. It's just a place for a uh, teacher to get out of his or her apartment to be able to stay on the property and not have to drive anywhere and um, sit down for an hour with a student. All right. All right. That makes sense to me. We also have a, a, a charity organization in town known as Safe Passages that's heavily involved in uh, law enforcement agents are involved in it and they, they do tutoring for students locally. So they might be a good people to recruit once you have that up and running. Um, Let's see, what else? Um, I, the gentleman who did the landscape architecting, I had a question about, um, you, you uh, brought up uh, how you're going to handle drainage on the site and it's gonna go through a filtration system. Is that gonna be used for, is it like non-potable irrigation too or is, is it just uh, to run into that, that site? I was just curious. I, I'm looking at the civil engineer. And if you haven't gotten that far. Took more I'm math okay. in college yeah, than I, I did. Um, but certainly we're capturing water in vegetated filtration planters on site to help with part of that first flush runoff, as I was alluding to earlier. At present, I don't believe we're doing capture and reuse of the water. That's correct. So, so we are filtering it, cleaning it, putting it back into the storm channels and, and repairing corridor cleaner than it is presently. Yeah, okay. 
Right. The one thing I wanted to add, just to go back on the fencing thing, not to backtrack, but we did put or propose fences in that existing landscape buffer along Lakeview Canyon. Yeah, that's what I assumed. No, okay. no gates at the entries, but I think there's a sense of trying to mitigate potential cut-throughs, the degradation of that landscape. And also, just once we start to park cars and we have residential front doors and stoops, we start to have concerns about perhaps attractive nuisances, people kind of sneaking in through the, through the understory. And so it's more of a being able to control where access and ensure visibility from a, from a also just from the, the police as well, wanting to understand where the permeable edges were. I, I would say as an editorial comment too, um, the uh, concept of having an access way from that Caruso property through your property and exit out of your property to a high school will be very attractive to people trying to get there <laughs> and leaving. <laughs> so, so whatever controls you do put in place, I, I would be, I would consider that. Obviously, it's your property. Um, the other question I had, uh, one last one is, um, you will be having solar on the roofs, I understand. Do you anticipate what percentage of your, your actual electric uh, electricity consumption will be offset by that? We don't. I would use an analogy, though. In um, our project in the Big Island of uh, Hawaii, we are 100% sustainable. Wow. But that's taking a seven-acre field, lava field, and doing all solar. <laughs> so it's a... It's a great thing to do, but I'm not sure we're going to attain that here. We're going to do, obviously, the extent we can with uh, solar panels to alleviate the draw on the grid, but it'll be, it won't be 100%. Well, I, as, as you also mentioned in the project, you're reducing your actual um, heat sink. Yes, yeah, almost an acre so, there, yes. So that's, that's huge, too. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner McMahon. I just have one quick follow-up question. Um, you said that the appliances were going to be all electric. Um, everything else, like HVAC and that stuff, is that going to be electric? Yes. Okay, that was it. Great, thank you. I have more than one question. <laughs> um, I appreciate that there are so many affordable units as part of this project and, and without a density bonus. However, um, as we all know here, housing is a critical issue. Um, just as a level set to know what we're talking about when we say low income units, we are talking about families of four that in Ventura County, let alone Thousand Oaks or Westlake Village, earn up to $100,370 a year. That is currently low income in this area, in this county. Moreover, um, we're not very good at producing um, low-income units. We, in the past eight years, met 614% of our RENA quota for luxury units, I think, and 3% of our low-income quota. Um, so while I appreciate that this is nearly 13% um, affordable, um, low-income and very low-income, and that's good, why isn't it higher? Why isn't it a larger percentage? Well, Commissioner Newman, I think it's a balancing act. We have a 500-pound gorilla in the room called a $25 million parking structure to build to replace the surface parking we're removing. And uh, I think our bump-up, as Carl, Carlos referred to earlier, uh, the, our voluntary bump-up to 34 units was uh, kind of our tipping point. And so it, it, I stand by that. It's a... Uh, it's not arbitrary, it's backed by our pro formas, which I can't share, but it, basically it has to do with project economic, economics to make sure it goes forward. And similarly, you know, finance is not our purview here. We're about land use. Um, I understand your organization um, does rental units all over the world. I, under, I understand that. Um, have you had discussions um, and did you look at this project in terms of not rental, in terms of units that would provide equity for new residents, in either in the form of condos or lease to purchase or some other arrangement? Well, wherever we go, we look at uh, optimal use of land and how it might best be planned. Uh, you know, and lots of things go into that decision, but uh, the core business is really the uh, multifamily business. And uh, in this particular case, with the you know, the need to get 
um, pricing down to the extent we can and uh, with a 3% vacancy rate in the entire city, we felt that bringing uh, to market something that is uh, in line with that more so than the cost of for sale housing with uh, whatever the down payment would be, would be more conducive to getting uh, getting to the affordable level, even though this isn't Topeka, Kansas. This is Southern California. We well, know those the prices. 3% you raised is, is very relevant. And yes. I appreciate that you're filling a need that the market has. Um, at the same time, we represent the interests of the city, and we hear from residents all the time about that we can't afford this. That's and true. We got, in fact, there's a speaker card here. I won't read the whole set of comments. They're very tough. Um, and one of, the, one of the comments is that by having so many market rate units, and it is 87% here, we're actually making the problem worse um, because it, it drives up housing costs. Um, I don't know how to, speaking of chicken and egg problems, I'm, I'm interested in exploring ways that, that break that cycle. It's, it's an inflationary cycle. You're meeting a need, there's no question. You're in business, I get it. And you need to make a profit on your unit. But there's this constant upward spiral that this resident is complaining about. And I, I just wonder, are we making the problem worse by adding 87% more to that, to that supply? Well, I can only say I think that's a macro issue. Uh, you know, I've read, some, I've read some ULI, Urban Land Institute articles about it. It's something that's a hot topic nowadays in just how to affect the right math. Um, in our case, here and now, I think it's the best project and the best location at, at the right time. So, I mean, that's... Going back to your opening comment about this being a balancing act. Yes, yes. it is. Yes, it is. Okay, let's, let's move on. Um, is it, just so I'm clear on the, the EV charging stations again, um, I heard numbers like 5% and 6% thrown around. Is, is it the intent that 5% of the, of the, the parking spaces or 6% on day one will be capable of having a plug that can charge into a car or is it just the plumbing to do that at some future point? I may stand corrected by our team, but I think it's 5% for the apartments and 6% for the parking structure. Is that, is that correct? Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm asking specifically about day one, when, when we move okay, in. Okay, so it's 10% that'll be pre-plumbed in the apartments and 5%, 6% in the parking structure. Okay. And when we say pre-plumb, we mean there's a plug that someone can plug into a car. Well, yeah, the infrastructure, not necessarily the above ground plug Okay, device. so we don't mean a plug. That We mean it, at some point in the future, beyond day one, there could be a plug. But yeah. on day one, the, the, the stuff that's needed to provide that plug will be there. But the not actual necessarily. Above ground, um, what, what I'm asking is how many charging stations uh, right. there'll be when you move in. Do we have that just to, from day one? Right now. Okay, the, the specific plan says it's just pre-plumbed for now. Okay, so, so there's not a specific number. Maybe that's a game time decision based on an inventory of, you know, how many cars are electric and then the company goes in and puts in pumps for however many they need. Okay. So it's, I mean, your intent obviously is to have, is to have plugs for cars, charging stations yeah. for cars. Yeah, it's I just, mean, we don't know what that number is. Correct. I'm moving, okay. Um, and then similar question for internet. Are you, are you bringing in a new feed for internet or how, how are you providing connectivity, network connectivity? I think all of the whole project will be fiber optic internet ready, turnkey. One, it's not unusual, but one, one thing we heard um, from the project we reviewed five days ago was that it, it uses so-called FTTH or fiber to the home, where every single apartment unit had a fiber drop in the unit. Is that, is that something you're, you're looking at as well? That's something to ponder 
but I don't have an answer for it. Okay. Um, I'm a recovering network engineer. Um, I, and I'm no gadget guy. Okay, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to, um, you know, we don't design here. That's, that's your department. Um, there, are, there are pros and cons to doing that. If you go that route and you're looking to burnish your environmental credentials, that is a lower consumer of power and heat than copper infrastructure, which is the way we built networks for decades. Okay, noted. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, the flip side of that is there are fewer providers. Your cost may be higher. Um, those providers tend to be big incumbents who will come in and say it's got to be this way or that way. Right. So everything in engineering is trade-offs. But okay, appreciate that. Yeah. 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 It's 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 a worthwhile thing to look at. Oh, and and there's infinitely more bandwidth. So that's that's always a plus. Okay. Okay. Fine. And my final question is about whether you've looked at. Um, interaction with the nearby YMCA. It has, um, it's a beautiful facility. Um, it's relatively expensive to join. The fees once you're in are not bad. I'm wondering if there's been any consideration of, of a discount program or some sort of bulk purchase or some sort of well, cooperation there between There hasn't, this but facility. once again, that's a great suggestion. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is an evolving this isn't set in stone yet, so okay. that's something we'll look at for sure. Yeah, I, I would think it'd be an attractive benefit for, for residents. Thanks for mentioning it. You bet. That's all my questions. Commissioners, are there anything else? Great. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. We now go back to staff. Uh, I'm sorry, no, we go to public comments. Public comments first. I think I'd have this script memorized by now. We have um, eight public speakers tonight, which means uh, four minutes apiece. And it's split almost evenly between uh, in-person and Zoom comments, so I'll try to flip back and forth between them. Nine speakers. So I'll call the name of the next person up and then the two people after that so you can get ready. For each speaker, we ask that you state your name, your city of residence, and if you or your employer have any financial um, interest in this, in this application. So starting out, we will have uh, Benjamin Ephraim, followed by Clint Foltz, followed by Ron Bloomquist. Mr. Ephraim, are you with us? Good evening. Please, sir. If you could come up to the podium, please, to the lectern. Good evening. Benjamin Ephraim, uh, a resident of Westlake Village, up Lake, Lakeview Canyon at uh, the Country Estates. So my question and my concern <clears throat> is the number of uh, vehicles that will be going from Lake View Canyon into Teo Boulevard. Uh, we are most days enjoying all the traffic that's created by the high school. And we're very concerned that with <clears throat> 260 plus units, depending on how many cars uh, in each residence, uh, we're very concerned about the congestion and how that would uh, impact how we get in and out of the subdivision. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Ephraim, before you go, the Commissioner Habas has a question of you. Sorry, are you up above the high school? We're at the very end of uh, Lakeview Canyon. North. So north, yeah. north of the high school? Correct. Yes, yes. Okay, what, what, when was that built? The subdivision? Yeah. I'm guessing mm -hmm. 25 to 30 years ago is my okay. guess. All right, I was, I was just curious because I'm trying to, I was trying to remember if, it, if that was older than the high school. So the high school was there when you got there, right? Uh, we haven't been there long enough to know that distinction, but. Right. Uh, 
I, I, well, I remember that high school didn't have a pool, so I, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, the, the, All right, thank you, sir. Yeah, sure. Thanks very much. We go next to a um, call-in speaker, Clint Fultz, followed by Ron Bloomquist, and then Jackson Piper. Mr. Fultz, good evening. Hello, my name is Clint Fultz. I'm a resident of Thousand Oaks and I'm a member of the Canal Climate Coalition. I nor the coalition have any financial ties to this project. Uh, we are pleased that the project at One Baxter Way includes plans to build all electric residential units and is eliminating so-called eliminating so-called natural gas from their development. Natural gas is in actuality a toxic fossil fuel with the predominant component being methane, an extremely potent greenhouse gas. Methane has a global heating potential more than 80 times greater than that of carbon dioxide during the first 20 years after it is released into the atmosphere. This methane is so-called natural gas, also raises indoor air pollution to extremely unhealthy levels as stoves and other gas appliances leak, even when turned off. Leading scientists tell us we must electrify everything in the coming years, and we applaud the developer for choosing electric over gas burning appliances. The Canadian Climate Coalition also commends the developers on additional climate and environmentally conscious features that include solar power systems, water conservation measures, native and drought tolerant landscaping, and an eye towards electrified transportation infrastructure. The, develop, uh, the development's uh, Cal Green compliance is highly commendable and appreciated. That said, we would like assurances of significant rooftop solar and increased EV charging infrastructure. We would also like to see a net expanded tree canopy uh, a majority native pollinator friendly landscape and a commitment to implementing the recommendations of the Ventura County Air Pollution Control District. Lastly, we appreciate the affordable units included in this project, but our city has a desperate need for many more housing units that are truly affordable. And the Canoe Climate Coalition would prefer to see the city urgently adopt and enforce measures to expand the percentage of such units in all new residential developments as soon as possible. So we believe One Baxter Way can uh, design an even more sustainable project and look forward to being able to support this project pending adoption of these modifications brought to the Planning Commission. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, we go next to Ron Bloomquist, followed by Jackson Piper and then Danielle Borgia. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Ron, <coughs> excuse me, Ron Bloomquist. I also live on Lakeview Canyon Road and Club Estates, and uh, I have no financial ties to this project. You know, it really, it, I know I only have four minutes, so I'm going to try to work fast here. But, you know, we have an already really bad congestion, terrible, high number of traffic problem at that intersection of Thousand Oaks Boulevard and Lakeview Canyon. It's extremely dangerous as it is, the safety of these kids. I mean, I've witnessed two, I've personally been driving on Tio Boulevard as people were turning in, picking up and dropping off at school and seeing two accidents with kids uh, in the last, I think, 12 months. The, you know, the problem is, for the better part of two hours a day, you got traffic backed up from Lakeview Canyon Boulevard all the way to Westlake Village Boulevard and all the way to the other side of the high school and it's clogged up and nobody can get anywhere. Now what we're doing is we're taking 1,200 more, as Sharon brought up, 1,200 more day trips, but then they tie to, they kind of fluff that into, they, they fold that into the walking trips. But you know, the 1,200 day trips is plus business. Those are another six, another thousand people dropping into the the, the number of apartments all in this funnel that all those people can get in and out of one driveway into Lakeview Canyon Road. So, I mean, I, and then they say that the fire department signed off on it. I got a hard time that they signed off knowing the situation of, of Lakeview Canyon and Teal Boulevard and then adding all this to it. Because if anybody stands there or spends an uh, hour, the better part of two hours a day in the highest amount of drive time that we have in this town, we got this huge mess right there. And it's really bad. I mean, I experience it constantly. My wife's office is a, a one and three quarter miles also in Westlake Village. <clears throat> and sometimes it takes me 20 minutes to get there, depending on when I leave. So, you know, it's, 
It's something to be said for, for inviting more housing to Thousand Oaks, affordable housing, apartments, or whatever. And as they said, it was a great location. It's less than a mile or a mile and a half or whatever parameters that they like to have to where to place it. But the flaw in the plan, you know, it might be environmentally friendly. You might have all the latest and greatest building, uh, building methods that you can have. But the, the fatal flaw is it's not safe. On the last slide of their slide presentation, number five or six was safety. And that I disagree with. For that, I think you really have to take a strong look at this, have somebody go and look. Now, maybe if they add lanes, add a lane going each way for half a mile, that could do it. But all you're doing is creating a huge problem and you're gonna regret it. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Questions? Questions? How long have you been there? Do you know how, how old that is? Uh, our house was built in 1999. 99, okay. Yeah. Thank you. And we were one of the newer houses. I, there's older houses in that development. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, we move on to Jackson Piper followed by Danielle Borgia, and then Michael Dutra. Uh, good evening, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you to uh, members of Planning Commission, members of the public. My name is Jackson Piper. I live in unincorporated Newbury Park, and I have no financial affiliation with the, uh, anyone in, involved in this project. Um, I think that this project is in an excellent location, uh, pretty close to ideal, considering that we're living in a suburban environment, which is very hard to um, very hard to retrofit with uh, you know increased housing and uh, additional units when it's already been built out. Um, but this uh, this location being as it is on the same property as a, an existing industrial building and right across a bridge from uh, the Promenade Mall, which uh, I believe will also, again, contain a supermarket at some point in the near future. Um, and also within easy walking distance of Westlake High School. Uh, it, it's pretty well ideal for an infill project adding residents to the city. Um, that being said, uh, I do have, a, you know, an agenda. As you've, if you've heard me speak at other meetings, um, I want to see as much affordable housing added to the city's stock as possible. Um, I appreciate that the developer wants to create a village environment and keep it uh, to a certain scale in order to uh, maintain that. However, I don't think that uh, the sense of it being a village would be hurt by adding another story or two to the project of housing. Um, and I, I very much think that the trade-off uh, provided by the density bonus in terms of additional market rate units for uh, additional uh, below market rate units would be worth it uh, to add more of those to the uh, city's housing stock. Um, given that these buildings are designed as three-story residential uh, structures, I'm wondering if the uh, developer plans to include elevators in the buildings. Um, I know it's pretty typical to have three-story walk-up structures in a lot of places uh, for apartments, and I get the rationale to uh, kind of make the, the development cheaper. Uh, but at the same time, I think uh, you know apartments that uh, you know all levels can be accessed by uh, people with mobility issues. Uh, I think elevators are very important to that, and if there was a, a attempt to add more units to those already proposed. I think that uh, elevators would be essential for additional floor access. Um, it looks like the parking structure is planned for a flat deck instead of a slope deck. I think that looks great. And I, I hope that there's the potential for adaptive reuse if and when that structure is no longer needed for, um, for parking, if that ever occurs. And maybe it could be converted to some other usable uh, purpose for the city. Um, I have to ask also if there is plan for solar panels on top of the parking structure as well as the residential units. I think uh, 
as with the, the city's or the, the Oaks Mall's uh, solar panels on top of their parking structure, I think that's a, a ideal place for them. Very thrilled about the all electric development. Um, I guess my other remaining comment is about the gate between the promenade and the, uh, uh, the development site. Um, I know you've explained that it's sort of not within the scope of this project, um, but I'm wondering really like, is it necessary so much to avoid traffic passing through that, that roadway? And even if the gate is kept in place for preventing car traffic, if there's a way that um, bicycle traffic, especially I'm thinking cargo bikes, could Mr. Have Piper, to if you could wrap up, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I think it's very important for cyclists and especially cargo cyclists to be able to access the grocery store and the other shops there. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Moving on, we have um, Danielle Borgia, followed by Michael Dutra and Daniel Garcia. Good evening, Ms. Borgia. Good evening, Chair Newman and Planning Commissioners. My name is Danielle Borgia, President and CEO of the Greater Conejo Valley Chamber and also a Thousand Oaks resident. On behalf of our Board of Directors and our 800 members, I'm speaking tonight in support of the proposed Gateway at the Oaks project at One Baxter Way. They are a member of our Chamber of Commerce. This is an important housing project for our organization as well as our local businesses that we represent. In addition to our chamber letter, we have a, submitted a letters of support from a number of local employers, and I'd like to share some of their comments with you this evening. From our largest employer, Amgen. Amgen supports the community as it continues to grow, and we support innovative projects that will make this city a vibrant place for all walks of life from around the world. Atera Biotherapeutics. The city cannot prioritize the growth of the biotech sector without addressing the significant housing shortage for our local, local workforce. An infill project on a site that has historically been used exclusively for office are the kinds of creative solutions we need to provide more local housing options. Fujifilm. Fujifilm is delighted that this project incorporates sustainability as part of its fulfillment. This is a well-aligned with Fujifilm's sustainable Value Plan 2030 and our commitment to building for a better future. Capsida. Many of our employees are seeking housing with walkability to dining and retail combined with on-site amenities. This is very hard to find in the city of Thousand Oaks. Takeda. As a global company, many of the employees we recruit are coming from or have competing employment opportunities in major markets. Those cities have modern housing options that are walkable to local businesses. Los Robles Health System. The project offers attractable, walkable to our acute rehabilitation hospital, very close to this site, as well as the promenade at Westlake. The thoughtful design, numerous green initiatives, and inclusion of 34 affordable housing units in the mix of the overall 260 proposed units is exactly what our community needs to build bridge the way, lasting residency, and a platform for housing mobility. And finally, Westlake Village Biopartners. Westlake Village Biopartners is the leader in early stage venture capital for many of our startups expanding in Thousand Oaks. We urge you to prioritize housing projects like this one that will lead to economic development in the biotech sector, currently the only industry in Ventura County that's experiencing growth. On behalf of our chamber, please support the staff recommendation before you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. We hear next from Michael Dutra, then Daniel Garcia, and uh, Danielle Bloom. Mr. Dutra, good evening. Michael Dutra is not All right, moving on to Daniel Garcia and uh, Danielle Bloom. Hi, good evening, commissioners. Uh, Daniel Garcia, I actually don't have any comments. My attendance here is as part of the applicant's team. Um, I'm here to answer questions as needed. Very good, sir. Thank you. Uh, Danielle Blum. Ms. Blum, are you with us? No, Danielle Blum is not watching. Okay, um, we've got, I think, a couple more for questions only. 
Are there any other public speakers that we, people who wish to, Mr. Haverstock. Sorry I missed you. Thank you, Chair Newman and Planning Commissioners. My name is Adam Haverstock. I'm the Director of Government Affairs and Tourism for the Greater Caneo Valley Chamber of Commerce. I am speaking on behalf of our Board of Directors in support of the Gateway at the Oaks project. The Chamber of Commerce has endorsed this project and would like to, you to recommend approval of this item to the City Council. Our members are enthusiastic about the development of the biotechnology cluster in the Rancho Conejo area. The thing is, you cannot grow our biotech corridor without also building housing. They are one in the same. This project would add 264 housing units within the city. 34 of these units would be affordable units for low income and very low income residents. As you know, the city of Thousand Oaks must plan for 2,621 housing units during the current RENA cycle. As you've seen from the presentation, Kennedy Wilson is committed to building a project that is both beautiful and environmentally friendly. They are also planning to make a significant investment to add a parking structure and they are going to be creating a walkable community to adjacent uses. This project will be a great asset to the city of Thousand Oaks and will provide housing that is sorely needed within the community. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public speakers that we haven't heard from? All right, very good. Now we will go back to staff for follow-up comments. Mr. Contreras. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Commissioner Newman. Um, before I get into response for public comments, I'd like to address a couple of things for the Planning Commission. Um, Commissioner McMahon asked about the um, existing height of the industrial office building, and it's approximately 40 to 50 feet, depending on um, you know, where you take the height from. The 101 freeway is at a lower elevation than it is in the surface parking area, but you have a, a ind industrial office building at similar height um, or compatible to the um, surrounding properties and also to the um, proposed parking structure. Thank then, you. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to thank you for that. And then as far as the, there was a comment regarding um, the offsite trees um, for the project mitigation, the 93 replacement trees and the 47 that would be offsite. Um, we, we would plant the offsite trees um, within the uh, medians, within public parks or other areas that would be for public benefit. Um, and then also we have um, the endowment fund for Costca, right, that would be applied to this project for the offsite mitigation. Um, as there was comments regarding uh, arena and whether or not these projects, uh, these units would be applied to the to the cycle, um, sh um, because of the the terms of the development agreement, right? You have a seven-year term. Uh, the 264 units would be um, applied to this current cycle, uh, of course, um, once they obtain their uh, building permits for these units. And then, um, as far as the public comments go. Um, we did get one comment from Mr. Ron Brunquist uh, regarding um, uh, the access to the subject property off of Lakeview Canyon Road. Um, there are two existing um, access driveways off of Lakeview Canyon Road. And in fact, um, the Ventura County Fire Department did review the project, did provide um, project completeness, and did provide um, conditions of approval to, to be applied to this project as designed. And so um, being that they um, the, deemed the project complete and provide those conditions of approval, yes, the, the Ventura County Fire Department did review the project circulation and um, is okay with that proposed design. And then as far as the um, questions and comments on the congestion on Lakeview Canyon Road and Thousand Oaks Boulevard, um, I'll go ahead and defer that to our um, public works uh, traffic team and they'll be able to answer um, uh, those comments. Okay, thank you, Carlos. Uh, my name is Jim Mashiko. I'm one of the traffic engineers in Public Works. Uh, just to uh, let you know, we did have a traffic study performed by a consultant for this project. And what they did was they took a look at the existing traffic counts at the nearby intersections, Lakeview Canyon at um, Thousand Oaks Boulevard was one of them. Um, what they did was they uh, did the AM and PM peak hour traffic uh, periods. Uh, and what they do is they, they, we have this um, sort of a formula. We evaluate the intersection during those peak hours and based on the amount of volume, the signal, uh, signal cycle lengths, um, uh, things like that, uh, it's given a letter grade. And for Lakeview at Thousand Oaks Boulevard, it has a level of service C. And then um, for the project, uh, they take a look at how much pro uh, trips the project is going to generate during those morning and evening peak periods and they apply it, they distribute the trips to the surrounding street system. About 75% of that, those trips are going to Thousand Oaks Boulevard, 
when you apply those trips to the intersection of Lakeview and uh, Thousand Oaks, the level of service stays at, uh, also at level of service C. There's no change in that service level, and that's within the city's acceptable uh, level of service standard. So there's, uh, you know, it's, it does not show that there's a significant impact uh, to the intersection based on the project trips. And if I can add to that just a little bit, uh, if I may, the, uh, that level of service, as uh, Mr. Mishiko mentioned, is the acceptable level of service uh, standard for the city, for city intersections. And this one does not fall below that uh, acceptable level of service. In addition, the, the peak hour trips for a high school area uh, don't line up exactly with the office peak hour and other, other uses. For instance, the 2.30 or 3 o'clock pickup time for the high school is much earlier than the, the peak hour trip uh, citywide for businesses and offices, which is closer to 5 o'clock. So there isn't a full uh, alignment there. And I also will say that, that that school peak hour is a 20 minute phenomenon. It happens at every school, particularly high schools, because of how large they are. They're much larger than the elementary schools in town. So at any high school, if you go there within that 20 minute peak crush time in the morning and the afternoon, it is uh, congested and there's no, you know, there's no really way around that. But the, um, as I mentioned, this is a signalized intersection. So somebody coming south from Lakeview Canyon Road the uh, high school traffic is probably, the existing traffic on the high school is probably more of a concern than potential vehicles coming left on northbound Lake View Canyon to come on to Thousand Oaks Boulevard because those are separate cycles in that, in that signal. There's no, they're not uh, um, turning at the same uh, point in time. So uh, as it stands today, uh, the, those residents have to wait and, until they have a green signal to turn and that will continue to be the case in the future. They will not be impacted negatively by um, that additional volume needing to turn left. And, um, excuse me, um, an additional and final comment brought up tonight by the public, um, by Mr. Clint folks regarding that we can only assume that the project would include uh, solar and that uh, they would like to include robust uh, tree canopy to reduce the heat island. Um, as we mentioned earlier um, in the presentation, we do have a development agreement that has ironed out all of these um, sustainable components for the project. Again, we're including um, conceptual landscape plans for you tonight that demonstrate that we would have not only mitigation trees planted on site, but you also have the pocket parks and the um, proposed uh, uh, landscaping um, for the project that are all components that are included in the development agreement. Uh, for the project and uh, additionally um, we'd like to reiterate that the, the landscaping would comply with the city's uh, uh, landscape ordinance and the state's uh, water efficiency landscape ordinance as well um, but so that would address the comments that were brought forth by mr clint folks that concludes staff's uh, response to those comments and i'm available for questions chair if i may uh, one other mr Curran. there are some questions with regard to ev chargers versus ev ready According to the development agreement, 6% or 26 spaces would be required to be uh, plumbed with a charger, and then 4% or 18 would be EV ready. That's the residential component. And then 10% of the parking spaces in the garage would be pre-plumbed. If I may follow up on that, does that ready mean there's a plug to put in the car? The same question I asked of the applicant. Sure, as, as I read it, it's 6% or 26 with a charger, which would be ready to be plugged into a car. Great, thank you. Yep. Commissioners, are there other questions of staff? Commissioner Buss. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, when was the last time we built uh, 16 or 18 units of uh, very low or low income units? I'm, I'm trying to think. I, I think we hit 3% of arena cycle last time, so I don't think we've that was over. that was low income. Very low was actually a bit higher. It was thirty three percent. Thirty three percent. Yes. How many units total was that? I don't recall the number. That's what I was. Not was, not a large number. It wasn't a significant number. Right. I'd have to um, look at that uh, project. I believe it's two ninety nine that you're referring to, and I, I'd have to look at the um, affordable. Two ninety nine was eleven. Two ninety nine was all eleven market. Is it? No, there's eleven eleven oh, affordable yeah. units there. Okay. Right, okay, I, so but I don't know. I don't know what the breakout there is of oh, very low. I'm thinking of seventeen ten. I'm sorry. Right, that was all market rate. Yeah. Two ninety nine. I don't. I don't recall the breakout of low and very low. 
the, the eight-year cycle was something like 33% for very low and 3% for low. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out when the last time we it's built It's still a this. small number, Wh okay. whatever it is. It's a, it's. Uh, but you don't know if you're up your head. I'll look it up later. Um, 33% on... out of 800 total for building permits. Yeah. So uh, whatever the math on is. the bridge that I, I was bringing up earlier, is that private That's or is that, or is that public? Private bridge. Oh, okay, so that's not your problem at all. All right, never mind on the sidewalk thing. <laughs> uh, and then um, you were saying that those trees are planted in medians and parks, et cetera, as far as the uh, replacement trees. Uh, uh, would we not plant those trees anyway then? Are these trees replacing something that we would have done, or are these trees that uh, we, we, I mean, I look all around the town and there's all kinds of stuff planted in our medians, so. I was just curious, is this, is this something we would do anyway, or? If we're talking about the uh, mitigation trees, the replacement trees, yeah, uh, those will, uh, will be additional trees that will be planted in the uh, medians and uh, parkways. We just planted 41 on Westlake Boulevard. There's still, I mean, we have, it's a pretty uh, large town geographically, and even what Thousands Boulevard and Westlake Boulevard, if you, if you look Are around, you there's them plenty the of gaps. On Westlake Boulevard? Uh, in the parkway, not in the median. What's what's the parkway? Uh, the, along the shoulder. Shoulder. Yeah, okay. but there's still plenty of gaps uh, all over the place. So that would be more between the be sidewalk planted. and the uh, in the street, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Or behind the sidewalk. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this out to the city as an editorial comment. Then, um, a lot of people have been talking about the significant amount of traffic there, especially uh, amongst high school students. Uh, it would be awesome if we had protected bike lanes on some of these streets uh, that, that led to these places so that uh, kids could get on their bikes and get to school and maybe we could reduce the traffic. Uh, if we're planting trees in our medians and stuff like that, though, we are eliminating a lot of the space that we could use to create these kind of protected bike lanes. So maybe that's something to consider as far as our, our future planting goes. Maybe not put them in places that we will undoubtedly, if not this decade, in the next decade, the decade after that, need for non-car travel. And these arteries are going to have to have to adapt. And so I, I would appreciate if the city would consider that when they're, when they're planning these things. Commissioner Lanson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, going on the affordable housing, I was just thinking to myself, the time I've been here, I don't think, uh, or let me ask the question, is have we ever added affordable units that wasn't tied to a density bonus in the last 10 years? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, this is the first time that we'd be doing a project um, of this magnitude with the uh, 264 units and of those being um, 34 affordable. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to think of a time that's the only way we get affordable units usually is through a density bonus. So this is a, a unique <laughs> situation, which is why I was asking why you were looking to do that. Um, 30 years ago when I came out, that Baxter building was in a much different use. And my question is, is that at that time, and against a much different parking lot, that, that was a well-used building that was, what was the initial tenant 30 years ago of that building? Prudential. Prudential. I, I believe it was the Prudential um, yeah. headquarters um, yeah. when it was first uh, occupied or constructed. And I remember going to a meeting there and every single parking space was filled. Any idea how filled it usually is on a regular basis these days? Um, I believe the applicant team has uh, the exact figure, but um, I believe it's a, a roughly 60% occupied right now. So I'm wondering if maybe that's a lot of the traffic uh, Mr. Berquist is, is, is referring to is that it used to be a lot, oh, sorry about that, I stole your thunder again, um, that it used to have a lot more traffic by virtue of a, a heightened use at that time. Uh, but it's been a Prudential, it's been a Verizon, it's been, was it ever a countrywide at some point? The one place it didn't have, but... Um, <laughs> And also, do we have uh, on TO any kind of um, process by which the lights are metered, so to speak, or, or in terms of synchronization, in terms of trying to maintain the traffic? Uh, yes, we, <clears throat> we do have um, uh, along Thousand Oaks Boulevard, the signals have an interconnect uh, hardwire cable between them. So um, we, we do have a timing plan from uh, Westlake Boulevard um, to, I believe, up to Lakeview. Um, so, we, I mean, if there's issues with congestion, we're constantly looking at, you know, trying to tweak and trying to improve that traffic flow that's, well, that's going through there. And that's, that's only like a block. I mean, it's not a, a long space, right? Uh, yeah, that's, that's correct. It's, it's, well, you got the, the uh, signal at the promenade uh, there and then uh, the one at uh, Westlake. So that's, yeah, basically three. 
Okay, so three. three. Okay. I don't know. Was that put in for the promenade? For the, the sequencing? Uh, no, no. Usually uh, when we have these uh, closely spaced signals, we try to have interconnect um, um, between the signals so that, you know, they can all talk to each other. So when we implement timing plans, we try to move that traffic a little bit better. You gave a, a rating of something that used the letter C, and, and of course, my brain goes to A, B, C, D in terms of that. Is that, that doesn't sound like that it's a C in terms of that grading system, or, or is it? Okay, well, that level of service C is um, looking at that uh, operation of that intersection individually. We're not looking at the entire uh, you know, grouping of, of signals. So when I give that letter grade, it's A through F, F is being the worst, A is the best, uh, but that letter grade of C is for that specific intersection. And that C, you said, has been maintained over, I'm assuming, decades? Um, well, that's based on our last count, and I think it, um, based on the count prior to that, back in um, maybe, maybe uh, 20, 2019 or so. All right, so it's been at least for a while. Mm -hmm. All right, right, right. and if I might add, you know, that, that grading system, um, if you, design your system to have level of service A at every intersection. That means you've overbuilt your infrastructure and you have way more pavement uh, than you need and then other uses are getting uh, maybe shortchanged. So it is kind of a balancing act. You certainly don't want, you know, Fs, but um, to shoot for only A and think that only A is, is appropriate is, is kind of a fallacy. And that's why the city council has a, adopted the level of service C as the standard for the for Thousand Oaks. And it was that before and it would be that after by virtue of this project? The, that level of service will be maintained the, at the level of C. All right. Thank you. And nothing further. Thank you. Commissioner McCran. I, I did, do want to follow up quickly on that. Um, and this is definitely more in the realm of anecdote than data. But passing by that Lakeview Teal Boulevard intersection quite a lot, my observation has been that there's quite a lot of congestion in two areas. One is, I, th I think there are three left turn lanes onto Westlake Boulevard um, as we go eastbound. And not just at rush hour, but really from 3, 3.30 p.m. forward, there's pretty significant congestion in those lanes. And um, a Perhaps a bit less so. You, you said 20 minutes. I've, I've observed it to be shorter and longer than that. But cars turning, um, cars heading eastbound on TO Boulevard turning right onto Lakeview to pick up uh, students from the high school. Um, there can be a very significant backup there. So I guess more so for the left turn lanes. But but is there is there a concern that? I understand that the level of service doesn't change at the intersection, but is there a concern that the level of service for the larger area, if we look at this in a, 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 a slightly wider scope, that, that that would be affected by these 1,300 plus, nearly 1,400 additional car trips this project would generate each day? Yeah, on the first question, that, um left going toward the freeway, I believe is what you're referring to. Yes. Um, for the afternoon, uh, this site would probably have the reverse traffic. And in fact, the, the numbers bear that out. There, there's more people leaving in the morning than coming home in the afternoon. Fair so that, point. that won't be their predominant use um, in the afternoon. But in terms of the overall impact, yeah, there was eight intersections that were studied. It wasn't just the one at the, the Teal Boulevard and Lakeview. And, um, all of them were evaluated and studied and, and, and to make sure that they, none of them are falling below the acceptable threshold that the city has. Okay, so in other words, from a, in a macro sense in the immediate area, the level of service is a C today, and it would continue to be a C, not just at Lakeview and TO, but in the larger Correct, in, in fact, in some areas, it'll, it'll continue to be a B. Mm -hmm. Lakeview Canyon at Baxter Way, Lakeview Canyon at La Tienda, Westlake Boulevard at uh, US 101 northbound ramp, so. Um, the C, we were just kind of referring to that one as the worst case scenario, but there are some Bs that will remain, continue to be Bs post-project. All right. Are there any A's? Just curious. Not in, the, um, not in this particular area. Uh, AM count, yeah, I guess you, you may have the, the closer data. The morning at Lakeview and Via Merida will continue to be an A. Yeah, that's pretty lightly traveled. Yeah. 
<laughs> 24 hours. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Commissioners, any other questions of staff? No. Commissioner Buss. All right, all right. We're, go we're going into the weeds, but I, I, I'm, I'm here. You've got my interest. So, what is the criteria for these these intersections? A, B, C, D, E. I mean, what, 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 what do you? Because you said A means that you've overbuilt the, uh, the intersection for, for the purposes that it needs. So, I assume that would be putting a, a multiple stoplights, all kinds of fun stuff, on a place where only ten people travel a year. But so so an A doesn't necessarily mean this is an ideally designed intersection, correct? What, what is your criteria? Yeah, it's delay based. The, the, this particular calculation is seconds of delay. So seconds it's a numeric of delay for basis. Seconds traveler going through there. Yes. And do you, and what's what's your time cutoffs? So the level of service A is uh, zero to ten seconds, B is ten to twenty, and C is twenty to thirty-five seconds. And you get up to F, which is, you know, two minutes or more. So, or so we're measuring in seconds. Yes. Not, this isn't like when the 101 stopped at Santa Barbara and State Street, and, you did, and they, they literally told you to turn off your engine for half an hour. <laughs> right, right. This okay. is just seconds. So we're yeah. talking seconds out of, okay. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. You measure that in hours. <laughs> right. <laughs> Very good. Are there any other questions of staff? Okay, excuse we me. now go back to... Excuse me, Chair Newman. Um, I do have a response for um, Commissioner Buss on his question on 299 and the um, number of affordable units. Um, based on the information that we have, um, it looks like that project provided for 11 um, very low units. That would be 11% of, um, of the total. Okay, so this has more units and didn't get a bonus density, and that one did get a bonus density and no, less units. No, all right, that's perfect. Right. That's, that's all correct. I want to know. Yeah. One moment, please. I'm not sure about the 11% part. It's 142 units, so I think it's a lower percent, but. But it's off of their allocated units, not including the density bonus. That's, That's how they do funny that. math. <laughs> there, there are 142 units and 11 of them are low income. <laughs> I, I know the other math, but I use regular math. Uh, Chief Assistant oh. Attorney Heher is on Zoom and is raising his hand. Ah, Mr. Heher, good evening. Good evening, Chair, and thank you, Commissioners. Just a quick point. Uh, Mr. Contreras did uh, mention 299, which had 11 very low. It did have a density bonus. But to Mr. Lamson's question, I just also want to remind everyone that we had the timber school or the daylight project and yeah. that had 26 affordable units and they did not have a density bonus as part of that package. Of course, we had a development agreement, but that was another one that we had in which they did some affordable without the density bonus criteria. Thank you. Thank you. Good point. Thanks for remembering that. Okay. So we go back to the applicant. You have up to five minutes for any rebuttal comments you'd like to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess I stand corrected. We're not unprecedented, and there is that one case before us. <laughs> I think staff, uh, and uh, based on the commissioner's questions and reiterations of the public comments, uh, have all addressed your questions and their questions adequately. I don't have anything there. Um, one thing I failed to mention is uh, we started working on this project or some iteration of this project eight years ago. And uh, when we got down to a level of uh, actual project proposal over two and a half years ago, we started uh, public outreach with the four homeowners associations that are closest to us. As I said, they're still quite a ways away, but uh, we worked through their, uh, either their property managers or their HOA presidents and we have a, a record of a lot of correspondence and phone calls and so forth and so on. But uh, um, the only, that's the only thing I really have to add is just to mention that, uh, which I failed to do earlier. And if you have any further questions, uh, I can answer them or uh, we would certainly like your favorable consideration tonight. I think Commissioner Buss has a question. Yeah, I just had one question following on Mr. Lanson's question of staff. Um, your, the industrial building itself, uh, what percentage is it, is it occupied right now? And are you anticipating keeping your tenants while you're doing construction? Are they cool with it? 
Yes, the as Carlos said, it is about 60% leased right now. And uh, we're feverishly trying to get part of the biotech, uh, part of the business that's, uh, people are looking around, you know, the valley here to locate and uh, we're hopeful of getting more tenants. But uh, as far as those who exist, uh, they'll remain and uh, we'll go through the construction phasing and the construction is uh, hopefully going to be uh, non-invasive to anybody. You know, it's going to be professionally executed. All right. Thank you, sir. Other questions of the applicant? I neglected to ask one other thing before sure. about, I, there was mentioned before of a building super, superintendent, um, on, on site, is that a live-in superintendent? I don't know if you'd call it a building superintendent. You know, a leasing agent can be many things. Yes. Um, it can be cop, it can be this and that. Basically, we have an on-site manager who will administer uh, the project uh, with daily oversight from our main office. Where I'm going with this is to ask if that, if that resource, that person um, and their family would, would, do we know yet whether that person would be occupying one of the affordable units? Uh, gee, I, I don't know if that, that's kind of speculative. I, I don't know who we're okay. even going we to. Don't, we don't know yet. Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for all your time. Mm -hmm. Staff, do we have any other comments, follow-ups? Uh, the only uh, final comment is regarding the the 11 affordable units for 299. That comes from the base of 96 yes. uh, units. So the 11, the yeah. math works if you use the base, but again, as a layperson, I look at the project and it has 142 units, and 11 of that is not 11 percent; it's a lower percentage. But I understand how the state calculates its percentages. Different math. Yeah, that new math. All right, I will go ahead then and close the public hearing and proceed to open up the floor for discussion and or a motion. Commissioner Lanson. Thank you, Chair Newman. Uh, I initially want to uh, thank uh, the applicant and the staff. Uh, again, I know this was tens of thousands of pages and years of time. Uh, and I appreciate the, the fact that you guys all work together. Uh, this is a co cohesive application process. You had your team together. I appreciate all that. Uh, and the fact that you reached out, uh, I know there are a few objectors here and there, but um, it sounds like you went out of your way to make sure that the, anybody in the community that had a uh, comment or suggestion or, or involvement you reached out to and I very much appreciate that and again uh, that's a testament to all of your hard work as a team and again any developer coming to Thousand Oaks please follow this model <laughs> this works in terms of making sure that you reach out to the community um, and making sure that ultimately this is a community-based project project not just in terms of looking at this one aspect um, I am a um, proponent as I've said many many times of an experience based economy concept we're not a goods economy, we're not a service economy, we're not an experience-based economy, so we need to find productive ways to create an experience for people, not just in terms of commercialism, but also in terms of how they live. Um, that's what people are looking for, and we have to kind of find the synergy between things to make those opportunities, and I think this project does that. In fact, I think this was one of the most creative experience-based projects that you're going to have the promenade next door, you're having the high school, you're having the YMCA, you're having so many things in the community that I don't think ultimately are going to end up having a negative impact on most of the residents. Uh, I'll get into the traffic in a second, but ultimately I see this as a very, very good idea of experience-based economic concept to create that synergy in the community that I think a lot of people will be excited about. I think it will create opportunities, uh, but it does come with some drawbacks. And um, one for me was obviously the trees. Uh, this, this to me, and I, I, I was commenting, I think I've been on the commission now five years, uh, I think this one project is, is the one that involves the removal of more trees than I think I've ever seen on a project. With that said, I have to be honest, when I went to this project um, a week ago, it was the first time I'd been there in 25 years. So I don't think, at least I know I haven't, and most of our community hasn't been taking advantage of those trees and going there on a regular basis to enjoy them uh, as they would in, in, in any other paseo or part of the city or a park or whatever. So I don't think 
in of itself, the loss of those trees uh, is as relevant at nor as it normally would be uh, if I had grown up uh, taking my kid to that tree or whatever happens to be, because again, this was a private business property that I don't think most of us ended up seeing. So I don't have a problem with that necessarily, especially if to the extent that we're going to have the tree replacement process that Mr. Baker talked about, and we're going to have some of those trees put into other areas of the city. Um, we do have a drought issue, so those will have to be put in very specific things to make sense. But again, the tree issue is a problem for me, but at the end of the day, I think it's being mitigated. I think, again, from a community benefit standpoint, the project makes sense. Uh, the traffic is also a concern, Mr. Ephraim. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Berquist, um, and Mr. Ephraim that was sitting next to you. Uh, that is a concern, but I, like I said before, this building, I remember being there and every single parking space was full at the time um, of its then use. And now it's not. And in fact, much like, in my opinion, much like the back of the, uh, uh, the Lakes Project, where the parking lot stays empty most of the time, except for the people going to this amazing facility, uh, I see that area uh, of the parking lot is probably pretty empty <laughs> most of the time. Uh, so I see that the traffic and the parking is probably not going to be as much of an issue uh, based upon historical uses of what that area was. Um, the affordable units issue, um, yes, we need affordable housing. At the end of the day, uh, people have to make sure it makes sense to build things. Uh, the fact that they're waiving the density bonus to me is pretty uh, shattering. Uh, that doesn't happen too often. Apparently it happened one other time, and then thank you, Mr. Heer, for reminding me about that. Um, but it doesn't happen often, uh, and we're having somebody basically give up on those market rate units to create a better environment. They didn't, they didn't look for seven stories. They didn't look for eight stories. They looked for something that actually fit within the framework and the, the structure of what was there that you won't even see from the freeway. Uh, that to me shows a, a developer that's working with the community, and I very much value and appreciate that. Uh, so again, at the end of the day, I, I think the project looks great. I like the concept. It's an experience-based model. Uh, all the factors to me kind of point towards that. So I will go ahead and make the motion, and I'm not going to read all the numbers, so I'm assuming if what I'm saying is sufficient, I would he uh, hereby uh, recommend that we move the uh, Planning Commission to recommend to the City Council to certify the final environmental impact report in accordance with CEQA. Uh, uh, approve the listed elements in the application based on the findings and subject to the recommendations and conditions of the approval included in the resolution, which is attachment four, and adopt the ordinance, which is attachment five. Thank you, Commissioner Lanson. Uh, Mr. Duran, is that sufficient? Uh, it would be better if we listed all the applications of the motion. I can do it for you if you'd like. Please. And, and my apologies. That's all right. I believe the motion is to approve the environmental document. It is on. I'm just not close enough. Uh, to inv approve the environmental document that you mentioned, approve general plan amendment LU 2019-70563, zoning change Z2021-70556, specific plan SP 2021-71106, development agreement DAGR 2022-70052, Residential Plan Development, RPD, 2021-70558, Development Permit, DP, 2022-70098, Land Division, LD, 2021-70557, protect, po, Protected Tree Permit, PTP 2021-70559 and draft environmental impact report EIR 2021-71100. And that's the motion I would make. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, are there comments? Commissioner, Commissioner Mc, Mc, McMahon, go ahead. <clears throat> oh, well, um, first of all, I've spent many years prior to this on the traffic commission and there is no homeowner near any school in Thousand Oaks who is happy with the traffic around the school in their house. <clears throat> I, uh, I feel bad that that's the case, but it's, it's reality. And um, it is only two hours out of the day. And Mr. Hadar did make a good point that exiting the Lakeview would be on a different traffic signal cycle than those coming from the high school. So I, I feel bad that there is traffic around the school, but I, I think that the benefits of this project outweigh the negative for two hours a day during school sessions. Um, 
The thing that impressed me the most about this project was the sustainable landscape. Um, I like that we're getting rid of the asphalt and the heat that it produces. I like that we're adding so many trees, sustainable uh, landscape, uh, the, the, tree, the native landscaping. I like that it's gonna be a more permeable area and, um, and that we're cleaning the water as it exits the property. Um, I also like that it's a horizontal project and it seems to fit really well with what's already there and what we want for our community. Um, I like that it is um, all electric and um, that we have decided that there will be some plugins from the get-go. So with that and with the other things that have been said already, I'm going to vote for this project. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Buzz. All right, uh, I'm going to concur with uh, uh, my fellow uh, commissioners up here. Um, I like this project a lot. Uh, I actually went on the property today and was hanging out on it for a couple hours. Uh, it's the first time I've been there since uh, uh, 1990 when I was on a scavenger hunt with a bunch of high school students and we had to go to that Westlake sign to get a clue. Um, so it's, it's been a while. Um, I love the idea that we are reducing the amount of, uh, of paved uh, turf on that site. I, I love the idea that we are still going to keep all the trees and uh, keep the landscaping, uh, that view on the 101. Um, when I see that building, when I pass it by, either coming back from Los Angeles or heading out, uh, it is, it's an iconic design, that building that's there right now. And, uh, I, and it, it's, it's something that's, that's always imprinted in my brain as part of my home. And so I love that you're, you're preserving that and that view uh, in this project. Um, like everyone else here, I'm very excited about the, the, uh, the uh, low scale as far as uh, the height of the buildings. I, I like the fact that um, you as the developer put a lot of thought into the people who are going to live here. And then that's your reason for not increasing the density of the project, that, that you want to build a project that people want to live in, that they're going to enjoy. I love the idea that you're going to have synergy with, um, with the uh, retail stores next door. And I, I'm hopeful that you figure that, that, that bridge out in a way that um, makes that uh, a, 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 a great cooperation and doesn't end up a, a, through, a through way for people trying to avoid all the stoplights over there. Um, <clears throat> And uh, with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and shut up and uh, we'll get to a vote here. <laughs> Not quite yet. <laughs> first, first, I want to thank everyone in the room and everyone remotely who's taken part in this. Um, we've heard many different viewpoints tonight. Everyone presented in good faith. Everyone worked together. I especially want to thank staff for all their hard work in working with the applicant. This is definitely a better project than the one that it, it, than it began with. And I think everyone on all sides would agree with that statement. So thank you all for, for your work as a community in, in coming together and finding mutual benefit. Um, there, are, there are many aspects of this project um, that I think are good and necessary. Um, I like very much that it's a horizontal project, that you didn't go for the maximum as, as we see so many times, that it is integrated with its, its immediate environment, that it is a much better use of the land than the one that we currently have, which is a whole lot of asphalt that's not doing much, very much right now, that it is supportive of nearby businesses, that it, that it is providing a more walkable environment, that it is forward-looking in its building codes, in, in being pretty much, uh, in, in being green in many ways. I, I think there's more that could be done. I'd certainly like to see more solar, more permeable substances everywhere, more, more, more a greener building, as green a building as possible. Um, the one thing that, that I'm stuck on is the affordability part and addressing the housing needs that we acutely have in Thousand Oaks. Um, and I'm not looking to pin this all on the applicant by any means. All of us have a problem here. We're not producing enough housing 
for people who make $60,000 to $100,000 a year. We're not producing enough housing for people who make less than that, but there's some separate issues around that as well. But in that, in that upper category, which is now low income, 62,000 to 100,000 is low income for a family four here. We need to do more. We need to find ways of bumping up that percentage. And I sort of half jokingly, half not, was teasing Mr. Cohn at our hearing five days ago saying, he's a really good lawyer, he goes in and negotiates, he doesn't come back to his client and say, sorry, I didn't get half a loaf or a quarter of a loaf, I got an eighth of a loaf. But when we say 12% is good enough, that's essentially what we're saying. We're saying that we have, in this case, 87% is market rate. And I do worry very much about this resident who complained correctly that we're, we have this upward spiral. Again, I'm not putting this all on the applicant. You, you made trade-offs to have this come in so you can have your business and you can provide housing that we need. But we need to find a way to break that spiral and to get our market rate and not market rate units more in balance. I appreciate what you've done to bring us closer to that balance tonight. And for that reason, I will support this project. With that, I'll ask the Secretary if you would please prepare us for a vote. Commissioner Bus? Aye. Commissioner Lanson? Aye. Commissioner McMahon? Aye. Chair Newman? Aye. Motion carries 4-0. Commissioner Link absent. And again, this is not a uh, appeal. There's no appeal period here, as this vote is a recommendation to the City Council, which will have the final say in this project. Thank you for, again, for all your efforts. Okay. We move on next to Commissioner comments in AB 1234 reports. This is the time for Commission comments in AB 1234 reports. Are there any comments of, I see Commissioners shaking their heads. All right, we don't have any of those. Mr. Dugan, are there any follow-up items, announcements, or upcoming issues? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, on June 14th, the City Council meeting will be at M the IMT item at the former Kmart site that was heard by the Planning Commission on June 8th, as well as a department report regarding initiating, initiating SB 9 and two contracts from the Community Development Department. Then on June 28th, the Council will hear the Baxter item and the Canvas item that was heard this evening. Uh, we have no items for the June 27th Planning Commission meeting, but on August 29th, the Planning Commission will have a public hearing regarding a municipal code amendment related to SB 9, a special use permit for the ascent orthophysical therapy, and a plan development permit for Julie Moses. Very good. Thank you. Not seeing any other comments, I will go ahead and say this meeting is now adjourned to our next regular meeting, June 27, 2022. Thank you. Good night, Thousand Oaks.